15th. Okay, it's July 15th, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the town council with an additional meeting held during this meeting. Uh, and that is with the library trustees. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum in the council physically present at a meeting location. <clears throat> However, several of us are in the town room tonight. Uh, we must provide alternative access to the meeting and we are doing that by Zoom by phone as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and through live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the July 15th regular town council meeting to order at 6.01. I will call upon each counselor by name and please indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you and then make sure you mute your mic again. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devon Gothier is absent. Councillor Ette is not here yet. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegney. Present. Councillor Lord is, yes. Present. Present. Thank you. Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Present. Councillor Shane. I mean, Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Councillor Walker. Not present yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to check the audience and make sure that none of... Okay. Um, There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know and we will decide what to do at that time. If you want to speak, please use the raised hand button. Um, and if there are disconnection issues, we will also decide how to deal with that. The order of the agenda is slightly changed. The discussion item- Lovely, I'm on a Zoom. Can I call you back after eight? Austin, thank you. Okay. Um, the order of the agenda is slightly changed. The discussion item regarding the Jones Library vacancy interviews will occur now, and the discussion regarding the town manager's goals will occur at the conclusion of action items. There will be a general public comment period, and there will also be a special public comment period related to the proposed water and sewer rates. At this time, I'm calling on Austin Surratt, Chair of the Jones Library Board of Trustees to call the meeting of the trustees to order. Thank you, Lynn. This meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees is a call to order. I'm gonna ask the trustees present to uh, indicate their presence. Farah. Here. Eugene. Here. Tammy. Lee Edwards. Here. Thank you. We are pleased to welcome our two candidates for the position of the Jones Library Trustee for the term that will expire in January, 2026. They're Roman Handlin and Nat Larson. And please correct me if I have misstated your name. Okay. Thank you both for putting yourselves forward as candidates. I'll be managing the interview rotating who we ask questions of first. For example, the opening statement, we will begin with Roman and then move to Nat. Question one, we'll begin with Nat and then move to Roman. Okay. Uh, We're going to begin with opening comments and opening remarks, and that's a limit of two minutes. And then after that, we ask in your answers to your questions that you speak no longer than one to two minutes. There will also be an opportunity for closing comments at the end. So Roman, we will begin with you for your opening comments. Hello, we can, thank you. I approach the board today understanding my office profile under your legal uh, I don't get hold of a college degree, but I learned public advocacy through grassroots communications. In 2016, I wrote successful grants to receive funding for local music and for campus arts capital. 
In 2019, I traveled across the country giving talks on labor rights and wage theft in the Pioneer Valley, leaving the testimony on the House floor in 2020. I served on the editorial board of issues during a local news outlet and project for nonprofit, speaking with James of Commerce and working on fundraising tactics for growth and involved. Most importantly, I spent 17 years of my 27 years in Western Mass relying on libraries like Jones, sometimes with the example of internet and printing access, help finding jobs, and further ways to connect to town centers. I've seen the political push against libraries from New York City to Amherst. We're in a time when libraries risk find mass support and where we need a new generation to speak out for these institutions. I'm at Jones Library at least once a week. I'm enrolled in summer reading program. I have relationships with librarians across Hampshire County. As a labor advocate, I believe in the importance of long-term careers and material support for our local librarians. As an environmentalist, I believe in libraries to a sustainable infrastructure, not just for my children's future, but for my own. I've worked with each organization I've been involved with to promote diversity and believe there are ways beyond what this board has already done to create a more welcoming environment of events and opportunities regarding racial justice and diversity of children. Investments in our libraries are not just about books, but create a welcoming space that will serve every walk of life that comes. I'm running for trustee because this is my community, and I want to be an example for those who may not know how much they can gain by supporting the amazing resources that this library has to offer and to advocate for equal rights. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pause for a moment. Andy, you have your hand up, but I want to go ahead and see if Alicia can hear us. Yes, I can. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. And uh, after we finish with the opening statements, can we put the clock up? But we'll make sure we don't do that for the next one. So we'll move to uh, Nat. Uh, Lynn? Uh, yes. Could you uh, ask Roman if he was uh, using his microphone button? Because I was having real problems hearing him distinctly. We're and checking. I'll... Thank you, Andy. We're checking on that right now. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, he was not. Um, is there, can we proceed at this point, Andy? Yes. Um, okay. It was very echoey and I had to turn my volume fully up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nat, please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Nat Larson and I'm interested in serving as a trustee of the Jones Library. Uh, to support the health, vitality, and future of the Jones, which I think is the institution that's the heart of our community. And over the last couple of years, I've served on the board and as the treasurer of the Friends of the Jones Libraries, and I've been very involved with uh, the staff and some of the members of the trustees uh, during this time. And as a result, I've become more and more committed to the efforts to bring the expansion and renovation project to fruition. Um, I look forward to working with the other members of the Board of Trustees to confront the challenges faced in this generational opportunity to renovate and expand the library. And at the same time, I'm eager to help administer the more mundane but critical budgeting personnel and other similar tasks necessary for the efficient and operating health of the library. Thanks. Thank you both. And we're going to put the clock up now. Okay. Our first question goes to Nat. Please describe your understanding of the role of a public library and the services it should provide to the community now and 20 years in the future. Thanks. Well, I think the Jones really should be the hub of the Amherst community. I think it should provide programming for all of the residents and the populations, including uh, from kids and families through teens and seniors, uh, ESL learners and others. It should be accessible to people with disabilities, uh, welcoming to historically underserved groups. Um, it should make available books and other reading and viewing content and provide programming such as classes or group activities. And all of these should be diverse, educational, informative, or entertaining. I, in short, think a library should be a place where the world opens up, where possibilities are limitless. And from the time that I was a kid, that's what a library was to me. Thank you. Um, we're going to go on to Roman. 
Same well, question. Uh, Mr. Larson said that really well. Um, I was going to say the library is, I think a lot of people think that the library is just a museum for books. And I think we can all agree that it's not just that. Um, it's an important third space for citizens to connect with each other beyond just work and school. Um, you know, my library card allows me a place to work and study and hang out. Uh, it's also allowed me when I was really low income to get free passes to cultural centers like MassMoto, where I wouldn't have been able to access um, justifiably with my income at that time. Um, Public libraries al allow access to educational programs that offer skills for professional development. I know Jones absolutely does that. Um, and also when we're in a time when free access to places like public bathrooms and air conditioning are things that we can't take for granted anymore, the library is able to offer that. Um, these are basic needs we would not be able to access in a lot of other places at this point. And it's really necessary that in moving forward and thinking about 20 years in the future that we're able to continue to offer not just this selection of programming and literature, but also these basic public services that a lot of places aren't offering. I mean, if you're have questioning your identity or your ancestry, or you have questions about yourself and don't feel it's safe at home or work, the library is a place where you can go and access those things. I mean, for a lot of kids, that's the first place that your parents let you go alone is the library. Like that facilitates autonomy and independence and self-sufficiency and growth. So I think in looking 20 years to the future, what I would say is to only build those opportunities for further growth for every member of our community and further programming in all of those ways. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to question two and Roman, you'll begin. The Library Board of Trustees is expected to collaborate with and supervise the library director. How would you approach this dual role to achieve the best outcome for the library system? So I think trustees are tasked with a pretty difficult role of advocating for both the town and the institution. Uh, the director holds an equally important role upholding standards of operation for staff and for patrons on the ground floor and supervising those operations. And I think it's important when evaluating the performance of a director or when hiring a director to listen to what current staff and citizens are asking from the library as a whole and let that influence the role beyond just the opinions of the board members. Uh, as agents of public trust, we're making policy decisions that the director is tasked with carrying out explaining and supervising, and they end up being the face of those policies, despite the fact that the board is somewhat more behind them. This makes it imperative that while the board is an oversight group, there needs to be trust between the director and the trustees to communicate needs across the chain, from citizen to patron to staff, to government, so that every rung of that ladder is in collaboration. I think it's really important to listen first to those on the floor, those librarians whose livelihoods are affected by current policy, as well as the patrons, if that policy is not supporting those who are daily working and using the library, I would personally expect a reconsideration of the decisions of both parties, the uh, board and the director, to reassess. I don't think the director and trustee should be at odds, but in agreement about what is best for those who are actually using the library and they're on a day-to-day, -day, I think hiring and evaluating a director whose work reflects that current need uh, is really important, while also that director should feel supported by the board and their ability to properly collaborate with staff and patrons. Thank you. Thank you. Nat? Yes, well, I think in general, um, this dual role of both collaboration and also accountability, I think that's not that unusual. I think um, in any organization with a board of directors uh, that has a CEO or executive director, um, and the board is responsible for oversight, I think uh, that's the case. You need to collaborate, but you also need to hold the um, executive responsible. So it's really the same uh, situation here. So in my experience, the, really the most important aspects in that relationship are mutual trust and good communication. Uh, in the time that I've served on the Friends of the Jones, I think I've achieved that mutual trust and respect with Sharon uh, and I hope uh, we can continue that uh, going forward. So I think that's the best way to um, manage that that dual role. Thanks. Thank you. Um, this time we will begin with Nat. The Jones Library trustees serve as a municipal slash publicly elected official and a member of a private entity. How would you approach these responsibilities? 
Yeah, so I don't think the roles are inherently in conflict. Um, the library is part of the town, and I think what's good for the Jones is good for the town. But having said that, um, it might be necessary to comply with two sets of rules in, in different situations. So, for example, um, open meeting law applies since the trustees are a public body, um, but the library also has to comply with uh, requirements like filing a Form 990 with the IRS uh, every year uh, since it's a nonprofit corporation. So when it comes to compliance and some of those issues, um, there are different rules to follow. Uh, but overall, I really don't think that the roles are inherently in conflict. Roman? Yeah, I agree. And I think it kind of goes back to what I said about the library director position. I think the answer falls in compromise between the limitations of the library's budget and the capabilities that the board has knowing things a little bit more intimately about the inner workings of the library versus the needs of the citizens and taxpayers. As publicly elected officials, it's imperative to listen to the citizens and the voter base and what the people in the actual town are saying. However, I think that we on the board of trustees are able to understand the intricacies a little bit more tangibly in ways that people who are patrons of the library may not be looking at budgets. Uh, they have access to that. They have access to attend meetings, but are they is the question a lot of them aren't. So I think existing as a publicly elected official within a private entity involves a lot of listening to the community and then bringing that back to the board and to the people on the ground floor in the library to say, well, how can we use what we know that other people may not be able or may not be watching or be able to under, understand the intricacies of and how can we uh, combine those two things to find a solution that is uh, beneficial to everybody with what we are actually able to do. Thank you. Um, we begin the next one again with you, Roman. It's please provide us with an example of when you have collaborated with a group, particularly where opinions were in conflict and decisions were controversial and or raise criticism from stakeholders. So I am coming to you both as a former editor of a magazine and a journalist um, at a publication locally that focuses on local politics. Uh, we are a project of a nonprofit. We are not a nonprofit, we're a project of one. We do have an advisory board. Um, last year, we were faced with the issue of the fact that we were focusing too much on one specific issue. Um, I am a labor journalist. We were told by the advisory board that we were focusing too fully on labor and we needed to branch out to more topics, cut some of our labor discussions and branch out into city council meetings, policing, other things. As someone who was primarily focused in a department that was being cut, that was very difficult for me. I was also an editor working closely with the advisory board. So it was a matter of putting personal opinion and my personal work aside and being able to work with this advisory board and with my editorial team to look at what the feedback we were getting was and put aside my personal feelings about it and change direction of the pieces that I was working on to further talk about cultural issues and other issues that were more pressing. So listening to an advisory board, working with my team, and then being able to say, let's figure out how to shift and compromise and change what we're doing to further uh, serve the needs of our community. So that is that is the main answer I will give in terms of advisory board and, and the concept of stakeholders, although I don't have those. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nat? Uh, yes, so, so for many years, uh, I've served on the town's community development block grant uh, advisory board. And in working on that committee over the years, um, our opinions among the committee members often differed, um, and our decisions were also subject to criticism because, as you may well know, um, money is always short, and there's not enough to go around, and there's always going to be criticism uh, because someone's going to be unhappy because their project didn't get funded. So in these situations, my approach was always to first to try to find common ground where we could, uh, maybe find the underlying rationale for everyone's individual opinions. And once those reasons were shared, I found we typically came closer to agreement. I know that at times I had changed my opinions based on 
um, the comments others made and, and listening to their views. Um, but for anything remaining that we couldn't agree on uh, at that point, I think it really comes down to a majority vote. And I've always thought that if we followed the process and people um, have listened, that I don't mind being in the losing minority uh, on a vote. And I hope others uh, feel the same way. Thank you. I'm going to pause for a moment and ask that Councillor Ette, can you hear us and we can hear you? Yes, I can. Thank you. Please have the record show that Councillor Ette joined us at around 615. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question. We begin with um, Nat. Nat. That question. The town has a commitment to end structural racism and achieve equity for all residents. What role can the trustees play to ensure the public library is a partner in upholding these commitments? Yes, well, the library really should be a welcoming place for all, uh, but really should be mindful, especially of historic racism. Uh, and I think the trustees can influence things like staffing decisions and programming to ensure that it's inclusive and counteracts historic racism. Um, I would also add that, that completing the renovation and expansion project to finally provide a permanent home for the Civil War tablets, I think that would be an enduring recognition of Black history and community in Amherst. Now that uh, in itself uh, won't um, um, change historic racism, but I think at least it's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Roman? So I also do believe, I mean, even down to ESL programs, and this is something I will talk about in a further answer to a question in the renovation project, but I mean, at a most base level, I believe in the importance of the diversity, equity, and inclusion campaigns like Project Ready, which is a library campaign focusing on that. Uh, as well as the commitment to cultural programming and staff inclusivity training, which I believe is already underway. Um, I believe in allocating further funding to local outreach programs, especially those led by Black and Indigenous people of color, partnering with our libraries and providing workshops, especially uh, led by, uh, by individuals directly affected by systemic racism. Uh, that said, I think the most one of the most important ways to uphold safe and diverse spaces in our libraries is making sure there's an emphasis on library policy that does not uh, uphold carceral relation to patron behavior. Uh, I believe there should be support within the system for de-escalation and conflict resolution trainings beyond just sensitivity trainings for librarians, uh, because our librarians are community pillars uh, able to offer non-authoritarian non -authoritarian guidance to citizens and create a space that is welcoming for everybody. So I think all of those things, including what Mr. Larson said, just creating spaces for more programming and for even further hiring practices and librarian training. Thank you. Roman, the next question. What do you think is one strength and one area for improvement in Amherst's libraries? So I think that the ESL and citizenship programs, I know it's a sister program, but those are really incredible, deserve all the applause I know they've already received. Uh, the information for these programs is really easy to access. The website is great. Uh, the particular focus on senior citizens and adult learners is really admirable in my opinion. Um, but I would like to see a more dedicated space within the library for these programs, for the ESL programs. Um, there's a lot of limited room in Jones Library particularly, not to mention my own library in North Amherst, which is um, within walking distance of my house. There, I mean, these are very small buildings. We are fighting for space for accessible space for a lot of these programs. So I think the libraries are doing amazing work engaging the community, especially with these ESL programs. And it would be incredible if we could just have like more dedicated space for those programs to exist at any given time really, and those resources. Thank you. Nat? Yes, well, I would certainly echo Roman's um, uh, statement about the um, limitations of the library. I think having said that, the children's reading room and all the activities available uh, to the kids in the community, I think that's really a great strength, um, despite the challenges that are now posed by an aging building and failing infrastructure. Um, but on the other hand, this building just doesn't provide um, an inviting and safe space for teens. 
So I think that's really something that would be um, really needed uh, and another reason why we really need to move forward with the uh, building project. Thank you. Nat, we'll begin with this one. What are your thoughts on the Jones Library renovation slash expansion project and the repair option? Yes. Um, so I really think it's imperative that we complete the renovation and expansion uh, primarily because of the programming and the vision um, that um, uh, this building will will um, provide for the community. Um, but the economic reality is also that it's the cheaper option for the town compared to repairing and patching. Because in this building project, we're able to harness the tens of millions of dollars of state and federal and private dollars to build a community center that we can be proud of for generations. And we can do this with the town paying less than just fixing the old building. Uh, so we really can't let this opportunity go. Roman? Well, I'm honestly going to echo pretty much everything that he just said, because we're on the exact same page here. Um, I, I know that this conversation has been going on for years now. This has been a really long thing, the renovation versus repair. And I'm going to echo exactly what he just said, that both of these things are going to cost money and the renovation project could cost less and it's going to be a lot more effective. Um, I mean, we're faced with two issues that both have big price tags, but if we want to see this library still exist in 20 years and be beneficial to the community, I think renovation is the only way to go. I mean, uh, Mr. Larson referenced the children's room. Uh, we have an incredible children's program, um, and we don't have clear sight lines in the children's department for parents to see their kids when they're playing and reading. I, we just hired a new teen librarian director. Uh, we don't have a space, as he mentioned, for a teen library program. The young adult program is sandwiched somewhere in this nebulous space between children and adults, and we're fighting between these two public community rooms that we have in the library for an immense amount of programming. I mean, Jones Library is growing so fast and they have already outgrown the space that they have. Um, we have the opportunity to renovate a space to have far more opportunities for librarians and community members to hold various events and programs and skill sharing uh, opportunities. And I think while renovation or while repairing would fix some basic problems if we're looking towards the long term of this institution and what it has to offer, renovation is the only possible way forward. Thank you. Roman, we'll begin with what strengths, skills, and experience would you bring to the Library Board of Trustees? So I have spent uh, eight years now working with local government and nonprofits on issues regarding labor, public services, and the arts in Western Mass, and partnering with community organizations in order to listen to their needs and accomplish achievable goals at the town, state, and city level, uh, county level as well. Um, I've developed close relationships over time with city councilors, city servants, or civil servants, journalists, labor unions, state legislator, and my local librarians from Hampshire County and Franklin County. And the conversations that I've had with them leading up to this election have been deeply influential for me. Uh, my background is in networking and public speaking and being able to communicate mutual needs across lines of class, race, uh, gender, age, and also I'm here as you know, a long-term local who is on the millennial Gen Z line coming in and saying that I think that more people my age and in the younger generation should be involved in municipal politics. So I think that we have an opportunity to relate and listen to the heartbeat of Western Massachusetts and what the people are asking for. And I think that even just speaking about a library trustee board has a great amount of influence to you know, influence public policy. And I've lived here a long time and I'm coming here as a library patron and just as someone who this is my home and I care about being able to have a say in that. Thank you. Uh, Nat? Uh, yes, so I do have a lot of experience um, with community and um, other um, groups and organizations. I've served for many years on the CDBG uh, advisory committee, as I mentioned earlier. I've been the treasurer for the Friends of the Jones Library, and I've also been treasurer and on the executive board of the Wildwood Cemetery. Um, and professionally, 
um, until my retirement. I was uh, working in finance uh, first as a lawyer and then investment banker. So I'm familiar um, with corporate governance and matters of you know budgeting, uh, investment, and finance. And I hope those kind of skills and my background would complement uh, those already on the board of trustees. Thank you. So, Nat, we're going to begin with your closing remarks and then move to Roman. Yes, thanks very much for this opportunity to um, meet with the trustees and the council. Um, I really think that as we move forward to make the um, completion of the renovation and expansion project a priority, uh, we need uh, trustees who are dedicated to this um, proposition. And there's a lot of work to be done. But at the same time, I'm also eager to help administer the more mundane but critical matters of budgeting and personnel and other things um, that the trustees need to work on. Uh, so I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work um, and look forward to that, having that opportunity. And I thank you for considering me. Thank you. Roman? Yeah, so um, I, I'm i going to be fully honest with all of you, and this is not a succession, but I, I did not come here expecting to win. Um, I have read uh, Mr. Larson's statement. I think he is an ideal candidate. I think he is a wonderful candidate and definitely has a lot more experience than me in finance and fundraising and experience with the Friends Committee. Um, I am really honored to be here today. And I'm really honored to be considered and to be able to speak in front of all of you and also hear all of the things that he has to say. Um, I also plan to be here again in 2026. Um, but beyond anything, as much as I would be absolutely honored to serve on this board, I also want to impress beyond anything else that I am here to show that people my age are invested mm. in this library system and are invested in this town. And I think that it is really important that I am here in front of all of you today to show you that uh, not only am I in this library every day and in this municipality, Ooh. that there are a lot of other people like me who are here and really, really care about this library system. And regardless of who you choose today, I am so excited about the hopeful renovations for a library that I really care about and that I've been going to since I was five years old. So that is what I'm going to leave you with. But thank you so much for having me here. And thank you so much to Mr. Larson as well. Thank you. We want to thank both of you for taking the time to join us this evening and for your very thoughtful responses to all of our questions and your opening and closing comments. At this point, I'm going to ask Athena to place Nat in the audience. And I'm going to ask Roman to just move back to the chairs. I leave my computer open. Why don't you just, you can put that away now. Yeah. Because you'll be able to hear the rest of the meeting. Um, we now have a brief period of time for deliberation. And uh, we want to hear from both members of the trustees and the council if you would like to make a statement. After that, we will move rapidly to tallying your first choice, starting with the trustees and then moving to the town council. Once we finish that, if we have consensus among us for which candidate will place that candidate's name in motion. So are there hand people on the trustees or the council that would like to make a comment at this time? Bob Hegner. Yeah, I just wanted to say I, I that the um, both candidates are very strong candidates for this position. I think they're both thoughtful people, and I think either one would be a good trustee for the library. Thank you. Eugene? I would echo that. Um, I'd love to have both of them as trustees. Um, it's To me, even though I'm not the youngest trustee, I'm not the oldest, and I really do think it's really important to kind of uh, bring younger blood in. And I think that would be really wonderful. Um, and I really like the experience that Roman has. It's uh, it's really, really um, important stuff, super poised. Um, looking at 
um, Nat, the financial chops are are super important too, and obviously has a lot of experience. So, regardless of the closing statement that Roman made that he doesn't expect to get votes, which I don't necessarily think will be true, um, it's going to be a really hard choice. Really, when we step back and think, well, who would be a a, a good addition here? Thank you. Are there other comments? Uh, Lee has a hand up. Then. I'm sorry, me? Lee. Please go ahead. Um, I, I'm impressed by Eugene and very moved by the two candidates. And whoever does not win is more than welcome to come and join the fundraising activities for the expansion and renovation program for the library. Okay. Are there any other comments? Pat DeAngelis. I agree that we have two wonderful candidates here. Um, it's it's an, a golden opportunity. Um, I was, I'm not sure what, I'm leaning I would like to see Roman selected. Um, I think that they are a person who has taken a great deal of risk and really experienced uh, life in similar ways to some of the paths I've had uh, walked on. And um, this breadth of young, younger people and younger people who can really deeply see and understand the value of the library feels really important, and I like the shoestring. <laughs> Are there any other comments from counselors or trustees? Andy Steinberg? Yeah, I want to um, echo for uh, both candidates' appreciation for their presentation and for being uh, candidates. Uh, one factor that I will be considering, and it'll become obvious in the vote, is that uh, I appreciated uh, uh, Bob Pam's contribution over the years because of his incredible experience in financial management and his insights into details of financial management. And I will be uh, looking at that question when we get to the uh, about. So, but thank you both. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Jennifer? Um, yes, just picking up on what Andy said. First, I really um, uh, appreciated uh, the <clears throat> interviews and what uh, both candidates had to say. Their <clears throat> dedication to the community and the library is clearly um, unwavering, as is it, as are all of us. Um, but I... With the outgoing trustee, um, I, I agree that it leaves a bit of a hole with um, the financial, uh, deep financial experience and skills that he brought to the trustees, but also a willingness to look at library finances apart from any, you know, I, I thought <clears throat> um, rather objectively and without a commitment to taking the library in a particular direction, but just really looking at what financially made sense for the library and the town. So as much as both candidates are committed to a certain path with respect to the renovation expansion, um, you know, I would hope and trust that they would also look at what made the most financial sense for the town and our limited resources. Thank you. Additional comments? A uh, point of order. Um, we're having an issue with the audio on the live stream. I'm getting messages that the live stream is not working. Amherst Media is working on it, but the folks watching on YouTube aren't able to hear us. If you don't mind pausing for just a moment while they reconnect the live stream so that folks at home can hear. We can do that, but we also are under a time frame. I understand. Okay, thank you. We're going to take just a moment pause. Don't anybody leave. Zoom is working, but evidently the live stream 
and TV is not. I'm hearing the the live stream. Okay, is live stream. Is I'm not sure about the channel. Amherst Media, can you hear us? Sound check for Amherst Media. All right, we're good. Please go ahead. Thank you for waiting. Thank you. All right, are there any other comments from either trustees or the our counselors? Seeing none, I, when I read your name, please list your top candidate, okay? Farah Amin. Nat Larson. Tammy Elect. Um, Nat Larson. Tammy, we couldn't hear you. Nat Larson. Thank you. Lee Edwards. Nat Larson. Eugene Gofrido. Nat Larson. Austin Surratt. Nat Larson. Pat DeAngelis. Roman. Councilor Ette. Nat Larson. I hate to be in alphabetical order. <laughs> um, Lynn Griesmer is a... Um, Nat Larson. Um, Councillor Haneke. Roman Handlin. Bob Hegner. My heart says Roman, but my head says Nat, so I'll go with Nat. That's very well stated. Uh, Councillor Lord. Either. Roman Handlin. Uh, Pam Rooney. Roman Handlin. Councillor Ryan. Nat Larson. Kathy Shane. Matt Larson. Andy Steinberg. Matt Larson. Jennifer Taub. Roman Hanlon. Councilor Walker. Roman Hanlon. Roman, you did very well. And we do want to see you back in the next election. <laughs> Great, that's what we want to hear. I'm now going to make a motion and seek a second to name Nat Larson, a registered voter in Amherst to perform the duties of a member of the Jones Library Board of Trustees until a newly elected member of the Jones Library Board of Trustees is sworn in. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, can I just do a clarification point of order? Yes. Is it name a point? I just wanna make sure we're doing this right under the charter. Name was the placeholder for the name of the so person. Should it be to a so point? To a point, to yes. A point. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Um, and the motion has been made and seconded. We'll begin again with Farah Amin. This is to just say aye or nay for the motion. Aye. Tammy. We need to hear you, Tammy. A 
tell you what, give us a thumbs up. How's that? <laughs> Tammy, will you try unplugging your headphones? Just, no, can you unplug them from your computer? I, I'm not sure that Oh, works. now we can hear we you. We can hear you. Okay, yes. Thank you. Lee Edwards? Yes. Eugene Gofrido? Aye. Austin Surratt? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Oh, she's absent, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Ette? Aye. Lynn Greesmer is an aye. Councillor Hanneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. It's unanimous. Again, I really want to thank both of you. Uh, this has been an outstanding opportunity for us to hear from all the people of our community. <laughs> um, we want to thank the trustees and the counselors for participating in this election process as described in the charter. And Austin, please adjourn the board of trustees. Lynn, thank you. And thank you for having us to the council. So this meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees is adjourned. Thank you. We're going to uh, point of order, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Um, I'm getting a message that if viewers are on YouTube, they should refresh their browser so they see the new link to the live stream. Okay. We can proceed, however, right? Okay. Uh, just a few announcements. Our next town council meeting is August 19th at 6.30. Uh, various committees will be meeting. However, the finance committee will not be meeting tomorrow. Uh, GOL will be meeting this Thursday and TSO will be meeting on July 25th and yet again before the meeting in August. Uh, we have no hearing tonight, so we're going to move to general public comment. If you are in the room and you would like to make general public comment, please make sure you have signed up with Athena. If you are in the audience and you would like to make general public comment, please raise your hand at this time. I have two on the register in person. Great. At this point, there are seven people in the audience. I'm going to hold it at that in the interest of making sure we get through the rest of our agenda. And let me mention to counselors, we have an executive session at the end of our meeting. We will not come back into regular session at that time after the executive session, but we anticipate that the executive session could take as long as an hour and a half. So just keep that in mind as we proceed with the rest of the meeting. Uh, we'll begin with the people on Zoom. Debbie, please enter the room, state your full name and where in Amherst, generally where you live. Good evening, my name is Debbie DeStefano. Uh, I do not live in Amherst, but I am the Chief People and Equity Officer for the John P. Musante Health Clinic and the Bang Center. Please proceed. Thank you. So um, I'm just pulling it up here. So good, good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to meet you. I just wanted to, you know, to bring you back uh, a little bit about what the John P. Musante Center is doing for the city of Amherst. We opened in 2018 and it's one of our primary sites. Um, we are an FQHC, uh, which stands for Federally Qualified Health Center. As a federally qualified health center, we were born out of the civil rights movement to provide access to communities who historically have had barriers to accessing health care. We provide integrated whole health care, including primary medical care, dental, optometry, and behavioral health. We also have a very strong community programs department that connects folks in the Amherst community with the service that they need to thrive. 
our community health care workers and health access navigators are key to connecting the folks in Amherst and the surrounding area to high quality integrated health care through both insurance and services. So far uh, within the past year, we've served over 1,500 patients here in Amherst, and that number is growing. Just some of the demographics of the patients that we do serve, 57% of our patients are below the federal poverty level. 47% have Medicaid as their insurance. Over 20% have languages other than English as a home language, and over 25% identify as Latino, Latina, Latina, or Latinx, or African American. We have partnered with many Amherst agencies, such as Craig Stores and the Amherst Survival Center. I'm just here tonight to share that we are here to serve Amherst and its community. We look forward to learning what the folks of Amherst need and collaborating with others in the town to ensure we are meeting our mission. And just as an FYI, if you or anyone you know is looking for a PCP, we can help you with that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I failed to mention that we will restrict public comment to three minutes and uh, I am not going to spend time on the first amendment statement I usually make, however, Comments made do not reflect the opinion of the council and we will not respond at this time. Uh, we're going to go to the audience in the town room. Alex Cox. Make sure the green button's on. Yep. Thank you. Um, my name is Alex Cox. I use he, him pronouns. I live in District 5 in Amherst. I would like to thank this council for all that they do for the town, especially for your diligence as keepers of the public way. And it's in that capacity that I approach you tonight. Following the conclusion of the streetscape improvements on East Pleasant Street, where I live, after every heavy rainstorm, there has been standing and rushing water like over ankle deep, spilling over onto the sidewalk and making it very difficult to navigate downtown. Um, I do not know if this is related to the streetscape improvements, which do make it much easier to cross the street, which I appreciate, uh, but wanted to bring it to the attention of the council because it poses a danger to people who are attempting to walk, which is in line with the community goals. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Catherine Appy, please enter the room, state your name and approximately where you live. Yes, hi, thanks. I'm Catherine Appy. I'm on Redgate Lane in Amherst. And I want to start by saying that I'm thrilled that the TSO and the larger council are working to revise the town's solid waste management bylaw to address a very key issue in the town's efforts to reach its environmental goals. And I'm really grateful to those who have been working for, on this for over two years. As someone who has spent many years in Amherst, both as an elected official and a community member, working to improve communication about important issues in our town. I'm also really happy to see that public engagement is one of the important goals as stated in your draft proposal. I do have a concern, however, that the proposal has advanced pretty far down the road without robust community education and public review and comment. The implementation of this revised bylaw as you all know, will have a significant impact on Amherst residents. As far as I know, most residents don't know about the bylaw proposal, and it has been my experience that it's still pretty hard to find information about it online and the process by which it was developed. I believe for the bylaw to be successfully implemented, which I really want it to be, there must be much greater community engagement and education so that residents can weigh in in an informed way. I know how hard it is to communicate broadly, so I ask that you take the time necessary to ensure that the process is as fully democratic as possible. I also ask that you make every effort to make sure the goal of community engagement that's stated in the proposal is fully honored. Thank you. Thank you for joining you. us. Um, back to the audience. Vince O'Connor. Thank you. I don't see the clock. Okay. Vince, please state your name and where you live. Yeah, um, Vincent O'Connor, uh, 175 Summer Street. Apartment 12 in Amherst. Um, 
So I uh, want to make three comments. One is despite the calls for toning down conflict over the weekend as the result of the incidents in Pennsylvania involving the former president, I, I think it's very important that we not adopt the posture of false equivalency in terms of dealing with conflict. Second, in response to Ms. Appy's co previous comments, I've been a tenant in Amherst for literally 50 years. Um, the solid waste proposals, as I understand them, do not even propose to involve um, any apartments, uh, which is, and I do live in one, uh, in the process of both composting and more effective uh, recycling of things like cardboard, which is overwhelming our recycling bins at Mill Hollow. Um, and I, I agree with her. There needs to be better public vetting and an inclusion of the half of the town's residents who live in apartments in the process. Um, third, <coughs> excuse me. This is the fifth anniversary of my proposal in 2019 to establish a commission, a uh, resettlement commission for refugees and asylum seekers. And I would like to again, and the people who have been willing to serve stand willing to serve. They speak many languages and have great opportunity to reach out to the community for people who are overhoused to take in refugees and asylum seekers in the town rather than have the state take over facilities and, and install them on their own. So I would urge the commission to establish a, a commission of the council, of the council in so far as it's headed by a council member, including 14 other residents and, um, and make an effort to reach out to the agencies that are looking to house refugees and asylum seekers who do not have relatives in here or in the rest of the United States and, uh, and, and welcome them to Amherst. Vince, your time is up. Thank you. Was that the signal? Ah, I didn't really think that was you. The, the timer sound. <laughs> um, For drama. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have a new warning sign. Um, Ken Rosenthal, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, President Griesemer. Ken Rosenthal, I live on Sunset Avenue. It's time for the Amherst Town Council and Jones Library leadership to tell our town that the plan to demolish a large part of our library and replace it with an even larger addition will not happen. The original design for this, now about a decade old, no longer makes sense. That's because its large and expensive footprint does not sufficiently acknowledge the changes in how information is collected by libraries and retrieved by its users who much more often than before are off site and don't set foot in the building. Just consider how often we participate in official meetings and friendly gatherings via our home computers and even read our daily and weekly newspapers this way. And just see now how I'm participating in this meeting, not in town hall, but in my home office. The initial effort to bid this project resulted in just one unacceptably large bid. Because the Jones is now spending more than $500,000 on architects to value engineer the plans in anticipation of going to bid again in September, there are two other critical reasons to recognize that rather than demolition and expansion, a plan B repair is the only way to succeed. First, the designers charged with value engineering admit that to save money, their revised plans will do two terrible things. They will destroy significant original, now historic elements within the library and they will eliminate planned improvements that were intended to meet 
energy sustainability requirements. Amherst residents cannot want this, these things to happen. Second, those very changes will cost the Jones at least $2 million in historic preservation grants the Jones plan to receive that they know, now know they will not receive. Amherst taxpayers would have to make up that loss. The Jones Library is not the only library in this three college town where so many of us use our campus libraries first. It has a special role sitting prominently in this town center and appealing to all of us, but especially to those who don't have that on-campus access. We all want our public library to be able to serve everyone well, but it cannot serve us well when its architectural integrity, integrity is destroyed, its energy sustainability is ineffective, it fails to anticipate changes in technology, and it costs taxpayers so much now and in future years that other key elements in Amherst, like our public schools, are deprived of the funds they need. I know it's hard for public officials to admit that things have changed and that their decisions must change. I just pray that you, the Amherst Town Council and Jones Library leadership will be brave enough to make the needed change. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us, Ken. Arlie, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Arlie Gould. I live in South Amherst. I just would like to say to Mr. Larson, um, I hope that, can you hear me? We can. Okay, some uh, something appeared on my screen. Um, that Mr. Larson can keep an open mind to the repair option because if the financial aspect of this project doesn't work out, that that's what's going to be on the table. And there is a committee working on a plan B. Um, and this is a real possibility for our town that we are going to have to deal with the building that we have. And um, that would actually help us in certain ways. We wouldn't be violating the historic preservation um, requirements if that were the case. Um, so there are positives to going with the repair option. It's not all terrible. And the repair option could also do some fundraising to offset costs. And the expansion is not always necessarily going to be the cheapest. There are expenses associated with it beyond like the interest on this large loan, which I learned today is about $8 million. It's a wash, I think. I can't really say that one is cheaper than the other, but um, I just would like an open mind and to really understand that it is a real possibility that this is going to be the route that has to be taken. One last thing, the net zero readiness, the grid is not clean yet. Getting community solar credits is great. It's a step in the right direction. The only true, really clean energy is making your own, you know, with solar panels on the roof. So anyway, thank you very much. Arlie, thank you for joining us. Petty Startup, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Hetty Startup. I'm in District 1 in North Amherst, and I want to congratulate Nat Larson on his new position. It was very interesting listening to both of the presenters. Um, I'm so glad I attended this meeting on Zoom. Um, I'm very conscious of the change in vocabulary that has happened over the last couple of months from demolition and addition to renovation. What is happening right now with the value engineering proposals is very far from a renovation. And I just feel like I would like to ask the town council membership and the library trustees um, to think about the possibility of all of these options um, and coming down on something that is going to preserve the historic integrity of our library, which is 
as far as I can tell, extremely unique in our country. Um, and I also think that we need to look at the sustainability issues that are we're going to lose with value engineering. Um, I heard on a meeting um, this morning that they were using the word VE. Well, isn't that interesting? It doesn't sound so bad when it's called VE, but boy, does it sound different when it's value engineering. Um, so I, I just feel like um, I wanted to express my opinion um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Hetty. There are two more people on Zoom and we will end public comment with that. Shalini Balmil, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi everyone, Shalini Balmil, District 5. I just want to thank you all again for your hard work for our town. Uh, I wanted to speak today to the Waste Hall of Bylaw Updates discussion and as a former TSO member and co-sponsor of the Waste Hall of Bylaw Changes, I know firsthand a lot of hard work has gone into uh, this process up to this point. And having attended the last few TSO meetings, I have sensed the frustration. I understand the frustration with this process. Two years is a long time and we still don't have a bylaw that's been passed. So I hope that my comments today can be helpful, especially to the new TSO and town council members. So in my comments, I wanted to reemphasize why town council needs to make this a priority and also uh, giving, keeping in mind that staff time and resources at hand. And also I wanted to, to um, offer certain steps that need to be taken before town council can vote on it based on the carryover memo that we, the last TSO had written. So what is needed, um, clarifying that the, also I want to clarify, there's a lot of confusion amongst the public, as we heard from Catherine Appy, one of the speakers earlier, that the draft, those are working drafts of the bylaw, but in people's minds, it feels like this is already a done deal. However, I just want to clarify that the charter requires uh, the process to include a finished bylaw. Uh, the second point, I agree completely with Catherine Appy that something that's going to affect everyone should include um, listening sessions to get residents feedback. Now, I also want to quickly clarify, there are two working drafts of the bylaws before the TSO. One was initially proposed by the sponsors, and since then, there were many discussions within TSO and I personally looked at best practices, got feedback from Mass DEP coordinator Susan Waite, and looking at different towns, and we updated the original bylaw to include more specific language around to create a more robust paid system, annual reporting. So basically, the intention is the same as the original, but the updated bylaw gives more clear guidance to the town manager with regards to um, the RFP. The, the third thing important is that the the carryable memo had the updated bylaw and an appendix of decisions that need to be made. And it is really important for the TSO now because we were waiting for the RFIs and could not go through that appendix of decisions. But like we did for the rental registration bylaw where we took each section, similarly, the TSO now needs to go over the sec sections to answer what they can. And that will provide guidance to the town manager. Shalini, your time is up. Okay. I, just you. last thing, I just want to say that I'm here. Shalini, your yeah, time yeah. is up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Jeff Lee, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Jeff Lee. I live in South Amherst. And I tuned in at 6 p.m. Uh, I went by the agenda that was posted on the town website that said that public comment would occur before the uh, trustee decision. Uh, apparently it was decided that public input was not necessary. But what I was going to suggest was that um, support for the renovation demolition expansion project is not necessarily a, a qualification. In fact, given the current circumstances could be considered a liability. Um, I'd remind, Everyone that the trustee that Mr. Larson is replacing was Robert Pam, who was uh, uh, truly an independent thinker. He wasn't afraid to 
oppose the trustee majority when he felt it was called for. He didn't just toe the party line. Um, at time, at one time he supported the project because he felt it was financially feasible, but he came around to opposing it when he felt it was detrimental to the library finances. Um, okay, secondly, I'd like to say that the citizens of Amherst shouldn't have to file a public record request to learn that the library director has had in her possession for eight months a document, a letter from the director of the Massachusetts Historical Commission uh, describing several adverse effects to the Jones Library, um, which the letter stated is, and we all know, is listed on the national and state registers of historic places. Um, this information reached the director and I assume the trustees uh, back in November before a decision was made to increase uh, funding for the project by $10 million before uh, two motions were defeated to stop the project and to continue without uh, value engineering changes. Um, so, uh, and also the uh, trustees uh, rushed into a commitment of $550,700 from their endowment to eliminate many historical uh, preservation features which is going to be um, opposed by the preservation bodies. Please take that into consideration and um, please start considering the opinions that you're hearing that are opposed to the library project. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. That concludes public comment. We're going to move immediately to the consent agenda. I'm going to ask the clerk of the town council to put the consent agenda on the screen given its length. However, I am ne it's necessary that I read it. So I'm going to place it in as a motion. If somebody would like one of the items removed, please don't remove all of the nominations. Just indicate which one you want removed, okay? Um, so to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 9.a.3, waiver of town council rules of procedure, rule 8.6 for the approval of town manager appointments to the board of health. 9.a.1-4, to 4, approval of the following town manager appointments. Elementary school building committee, Melissa Zawadowski, Zawatsky, thank you. Finance director for a length, for a term to last the length of the building process. Jones Library Building Committee, Melissa Zadowski, Zawatsky, thank you. I'll try it again. Finance Director for a term to last the length of the building process. Board of Health, Betsy Brooks and Jack Jemsik, for terms to expire June 30th, 2027. Affordable Housing Trust, Allegra Cullark, for a term to expire June 30th, 2026. Grover Wyman Brown, for a term to expire June 30th, 2026. Board of License Commissioners, Marion Walker for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, Suzanne Schilling for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Community Preservation Act Committee, Timothy Neal for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, Deborah Ferrara for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Conservation Commission, um, Andre Gadera for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Michelle Labay Lab Lab uh, for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Cultural Council, Christy Anderson for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Uh, Eleanor Walsh, to, for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Energy 2025, thank you so much for the correction. Energy and Climate Action Committee, Donald Allison for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Historical Commission, Anthony Brill Brillenborg for a term to expire June 30th, 2026. Michaelia Rasnick, for a term to expire June 30th, 2027.
Human Rights Commission, Razwana Khan for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Local Historic District Commission, Nancy Ratner for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Elizabeth Sharp for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Munson Memorial Building Trustees, Alexander Niefer for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Public Arts Commission, Dara Barros Dixon for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Public Tra Shade Tree Committee, Shoshana King for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Henry LaPen for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Recreation Committee Commission, Sanjay Arwad for a term to expire June 30, 2027. Matt Kane for a term to expire June 30, 2027. Registry, Registrar of Voters, Jacqueline Gardner, for a term to expire June 30, 2027. Resident Advisory Committee, Anastasia Ordinez, for a term to expire June 30, 2027. Water Supply Protection Committee, Brian Yellen, for a term to expire June 30, 2027. And 11A to B approval of the following meeting minutes, March 27, 2024, special meeting, April 1st, 2024, regular meeting. Hold on, Mandy Joe. Mm -hmm. I see you're there. Um, okay. Um, Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. I have a point of information question. Um, yes. If I want to make a comment on one of these, do I need to remove it from the consent agenda just to make a comment? Technically, but in the interest of time, no. Please proceed. On my comment? Yeah. Oh, okay. We're not going to do the comments when we get to it on the agenda then? Okay. Um, you haven't asked to remove it, so. I am not going to remove it if I can make a comment, um, which is given that... I guess I want to say that I thought it was inappropriate personally for counselors to weigh in on appointments prior to the manager making appointments when counselors do not know who all applied for positions. So to put weight onto a name for an appointment without knowing all of the information, I just thought was inappropriate. Thank you for your comment. Are there is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. We're going to move to the vote. We begin with Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagen. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. That's 12 in favor and one absent. We're going to move to our next item on the agenda, which is a presentation regarding town services and outreach committee. It is merely an update. We are not doing any voting tonight, but if you have questions, you can either raise them tonight or you can send them to Andy Steinberg, chair of the committee. Uh, Andy? Yes, hi, I'm back. So um, I'm gonna start and then uh, uh, Jennifer's, uh, who's also a co-sponsor um, and is also on the TSO committee is going to uh, follow follow what I'm going to say, and we're going to try and be very brief. Um, there are a couple of items that were placed in the packet to try and um, give some explanation, and with that, with the hope that we wouldn't have to go through all of the information that is presented um, there. But uh, the original referral included a very extensive presentation that was presented by the um, sponsors. And uh, I give Shalini Balmelm the credit as being then a, uh, a member of the council who 
uh, did the um, lion's share of the work on the presentation that's in the packet and really explains it. The other is the um, MMA uh, meeting notes. But briefly, um, in 2017, the as you've heard, the uh, Refuse and Recycling Management Committee uh, developed a solid waste master plan um, and it was presented to the select board. Um, at that time, I was the uh, select board liaison to that committee and a member of the select board. Um, and uh, the um, basics of it, uh, I think that uh, Jennifer is going to explain what we were do. And uh, what we were, uh, we then uh, moved to a long period of time after it was uh, it originally introduced in 2022 and with a very basic bylaw change to the current bylaw, uh, it was assigned, it was referred to TSO. And TSO took a lot longer um, in addressing it than um, some of us would have liked, um, but I think it was necessary for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that there were some very other very important policies that were being considered by TSO, and it was just a matter of how much the um, committee could take on it at any given time. And the other is the complexity of the um, issue itself and the feeling that we really needed more information so that the original concentration was to do what is known as a request for information and send out to uh, waste haulers um, a uh, questionnaire uh, that um, asked them if they would be willing to respond, and three did, and uh, provided really valuable information, but not a complete set of information, because in the end, what it didn't include was the pricing element and the cost elements that had to do with it. Um, and at the same time, uh, Councillor Ball Milne, as a member of the TSO, did a lot of very important work on identifying uh, best practices and uh, thinking through the bylaw as it was originally proposed and how it might be um, expanded and uh, uh, to become a more complete and understandable bylaw. Uh, TSO never had the opportunity in the 2023 term to uh, really discuss the bylaws and the current TSO. We have not uh, focused on the actual bylaw. That is something that will be done in the future. Uh, we um, very much think that a request for proposals and getting back an actual proposal with pricing information and knowing exactly what would be offered um, doesn't have to be accepted, but that is what we are intending to present to you in the next uh, uh, meeting in August. Uh, so this is kind of in the nature of a screen to kind of just give you an overview of what this is about and to, as, uh, uh, as Lynn has indicated, um, invite your questions that don't have to be submitted at this meeting. They'll be noted if you make them, but uh, it can be done later um, and give you some time to think about the questions that you would like to pose. But uh, what we're suggesting and we'll explain more fully for the, um, is, is as we go along before the August meeting is that uh, we do a request um, for proposals, um, see what proposals we get back um, with real cost information and um, begin um, an analysis of how we can move forward in the most expeditious way. Uh, the last comment I'm going to make and then turn it over to Jennifer is, is that uh, I do acknowledge that 
there's uh, also, as it was discussed um, earlier in the in the meeting in a different format, um, feeling uh, recognition that we need to use this time to um, also reach out to the community, inform them about the benefits that we seek and um, an honest uh, explanation of what, about what the change would mean and hear from the community and hear questions that uh, come along and that, that uh, is something that also uh, when we talked to the town manager at the last TSO meeting, which was not reflected in the report because the uh, report was, um, it was, it, the, it was just on Thursday. So we didn't have time to completely update the report to um, get into all of the details, but he raised the question of getting um, assistance also on the community outreach piece. So Jennifer, uh, why don't I turn it over to okay. you? Uh, thank you, Andy. Um, so I'll just add a, a bit, uh, you know, uh, briefly to what Andy just said that in TSO, we have spent probably the last year um, working with the staff, the staff really taking the lead in issuing a request for information to see what, if there were vendors that do waste collection that would be interested in serving uh, the town of Amherst, um, if we were to transition, this was what is in the proposed and it's um, the proposed amendment to general bylaw 3.3. It's now called the refuge collection and recyclable materials bylaw. And as part of the proposed amended language, it would become the refuge collection and recyclable and compostable materials bylaw because um, having universal curbside compost pickup would be um, an integral part of the service that we hope would be part of um, a improved waste collection system. So as per um, the former Amherst Refuge and Recycling Management Committee that met uh, started meeting seven years ago, um, uh, together with those municipalities who were part of this year's um, Massachusetts Municipal Association Conference, there was a special session on municipal waste reduction. Um, those municipalities, as well as Zero Waste Amherst and our Energy and Climate Action Committee, um, all uh, support the goal of the proposed amendment to our general bylaw 3.3 .3 to reduce um, the amount of waste that Amherst sends to landfills and to be able to reduce the you know, trash that individual households and residents um, discard on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So a part of this, the revised um, bylaw that we are, that has been, that we are not proposing today because we, it is not in final form, but that we have been working on would involve the town contract going out for a competitive bid so that we can see if we can get the best price possible for uh, property owners and um, residents in town, that would be a competitively bid price and contract that the town would administer. And we would ask that the fee structure be on a what they call pay as you throw basis, struck fee structure. So that incentivizes households to reduce the trash that they throw away, just like, you know, we keep our air conditioning, we only use it when necessary, and we, you know, keep it as high as we possibly can. We turn lights off because we pay as we use, and that is the kind of system we hope to have for our trash disposal. And also to have curbside compost pickup be an integral part of the service. So just as 20 or more years ago, it seemed very novel to recycle and that that could be burdensome. That's something we all do now. It's kind of second nature and we would like composting to be a part of that so we can reduce the food waste and other organics that find their way into our landfills and waste stream. So we were so over the past um, year, several months, we did receive three, three vendors responded to our request for information. So we know that there are three uh, waste hauler um, 
companies that are interested and would like to do business with the town of Amherst. So they shared with us the kind of service that they can provide and that they are providing to other municipalities in the area, but it did not include pricing because that's not what we requested. And as we've been going around in discussions with TSO, and it's been very helpful having members on the committee that weren't um, during the last council session to uh, bring fresh eyes to the discussion, is that we really couldn't come back to the council and ask you to vote on adopting the bylaw. One, we know we have to do a lot of outreach to the community, and that's something that we plan to do. It's gonna be a good year or so before we're gonna be in a position to be probably voting on the um, you know, final bylaw. And during that time, we even spoke with the town manager during the last TSO meeting that we would probably retain a consultant to go out and really you know, do very systematic and deep outreach in the community to hear what residents would like, what they feel they could live with, and educating the community on uh, what the goals are and what the mechanics of such a, a program could be. But we also realize that we're kind of going around in circles because if we come back to the council and ask you to vote on an amended bylaw, you're gonna ask us what the cost is. And we can't really provide you know, hard and fast figures for what it's going to cost without issuing a request for proposal and ask the vendors what the fee would be. So the town in several conversations with the town manager, he agreed that it probably made sense to ask the council and we're not asking you at this meeting, we will come back with a more in depth presentation on August 19th at our next meeting. And of course, as Andy said, welcome your questions in the interim so we can respond as part of the presentation on the 19th. But that we would ask that for the council to recommend that the town manager issue a request for proposals so we can get the pricing information so we know both if it's possible, what different combinations of services will cost us. And so the council can make an informed decision. And we, we didn't feel we could come back to you without having that information and that there was no other way to really get that information. So that's, that brings us to where we are. That's our update. And we'll come back um, you know, with responses to the, any questions that you may have. And I think Andy said, if you could get those questions to him by next Monday morning, TSO is meeting a week from this Thursday, that would be very helpful. And that's where we are. Kathy. Thank, thank you all for uh, staying with us over the last, I guess, couple of years. Um, um, uh, in addition, I will write up my questions, but um, do you want to take questions now as well, general questions? In a sparing way, yes. Okay, uh, I'll do, Lynn wants me to be terse. Is what <laughs> I looked at the MMA document, which I thought was really helpful because they gave a couple examples of towns, including Longmeadow, that seems to have done it well, and another that didn't do it so well in terms of taking it over. So my my question is going to be uh, to try to quantify the staff requirements at the town, so not just what we'd have to pay for the recycling. It looked like we are going to need a consultant to help us draft the RFP. And uh, in Longmeadow, they structured it in a particular way with different services. So when will we decide how we wanna do with it? Um, I think this completely eliminates the ability not to contract with anything, but just get a sticker from the town and go to the dump. Um, unless I'm, so I don't know how many residents currently use that vehicle where they're, and then they're paying for their bags of trash, but otherwise they can do everything. Um, and and so Jennifer, as you said, I've always asked what's the cost versus USA. Um, and then finally, if, if it's bid and the dollar looks like it's at or higher than what we're now paying, does this stop everything or, do we go back to the drawing board? Okay, we're not gonna to try to answer those questions, just raise them. I will send them in because uh, these are all gonna matter, I think, to residents um, uh, as they consider this. Thank you. Then you, Joe, Councilor Haneke. Um, some of the similar questions, I won't get too far into details, I will send them there, but 
but it would be very helpful to see the current draft of a bylaw that TSO has been dealing with, because I assume it's not the one that was presented two years ago, but maybe it is. I don't know. Um, my questions are sort of based on that. Um, Kathy touched on one of them, which is, does using the word universal curbside to me implies that the transfer, transfer station would no longer be an option for throwing out trash. Um, so is it an opt out? Is it an opt in? What, cause universal to RFPs seems to mean everyone must. Um, so there needs to be a lot of, I have a lot of questions around what would actually be required for residents to do or not. And if we're, double operating a transfer station in this again, and what is the cost? What is the cost towards a transfer station? But um, some of my other questions relate to what else are we doing? And are we looking at other ways to reduce waste? The MMA presentation seemed to show that getting people to re recycle what's already recyclable and required to be recycled would actually make more of a difference and an impact than requiring curbside composting from the chart, because that, that 39% of our solid waste is recyclables and only 29% is compostables. Um, and so what are we doing to enforce our current recycling bylaw? And how are we enforcing that? Things like that to, because just creating the law clearly doesn't reduce the waste that we could be, um, but it might increase costs to everyone. Are we looking at other requirements to reduce wastes? Things like requiring businesses that sell recyclable containers, particularly food and drink establishments to provide composting recycling containers, not just trash containers. Are we looking at providing composting and trash containers on our own streets um, in our public trash areas in downtown to provide recycling and all to help with things like that? Um, what about requiring hotels to provide compost and recycling in rooms instead of just trash containers, things like that. Um, it's not just about households, it's about businesses, it's about people on the go and everything too. So what can we do beyond whatever this waste hauling is, is part of my question, because I don't think we should ignore that. If we put out an RFP, do we have to actually do a contract? And I guess I'm still confused with how can we put out an RFP if we don't know what the bylaw would require? Um, and so I, I, it goes back to what, what Jennifer was saying about we're in a circle, but if we don't know if we're going to have an opt out, how do we put out an RFP? Because don't the waste haulers need to know how many households they'll have um, and, and things like that. Um, if we don't know if we're going to require local processing in a bylaw, which the original draft bylaw required for local processing of compost, how do we put out an RFP? Um, things like that. So I'd like TSO to answer some of those questions on how are we going to determine what the RFP is asking for if we haven't actually made some decisions on what we would actually want to require. Thank you. I'll send the rest of my questions to the chair. Great. Um Pam Rooney. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a question for uh, data from the town itself. And will the town be able to provide us the number of uh, current dwelling units as a baseline for anything that's proposed here? Okay. Uh, Jennifer, we're not trying to answer questions. I just want yeah, to. Yeah, no, I just, because I don't want this hanging out there for the next two weeks for, for, member, for the community. There, this is based on the assumption that the transfer station will remain open. That will okay. continue. That the, we, this is all based on the assumption that the transfer station will remain open and an option. So as several members of the TSO and even several a couple of sponsors of the bylaw currently avail themselves of the transfer station, they do not do not right. have curbside uh, trash collection that will continue to be an option for town residents. So by universal composting, we meant, what I think has always been meant by that is that a basic part of the service would be that the waste hauler, as they pick up recyclables, would also pick up compostable material. I'm gonna take another question from Pat DeAngelis. Yeah, I have, several have already been asked, that, but I will put them in my list. I wanna go back to the exemptions uh, that have currently existed in terms of uh, um, uh, subdivisions or, or um, planned communities. Um, 
neighborhood associations, that's the word. They're not included in the original proposal. And apartment complexes are not included. And it, well, phased in, but why should, uh, Mandy, I think you live in a, with a neighborhood association. Why should she get to phase in later than me? Uh, when I'm a single household, I'm not part of an association. The trash gets picked up at my house and it gets picked up at her. I support this um, idea very much, but I am very concerned that given the time frame that we have, that we're still saying, oh, well, we need the exemptions for neighborhood associations and apartment complexes and businesses. So I want to understand why. Um, and if we're going to educate the public, why aren't we educating businesses, homeowner associations, et cetera? Are there any other burning questions people feel they need to state in public? I will just tell you that my list already has 14 on it, so um, don't be shy. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. Okay, Pat, you're also done. Okay, uh, we're going to take up the next um, two action, the next three action items. Uh, so let me just begin, and we have joining us tonight, um, Town Clerk Sue Audet. Thank you, Sue, for joining us. We're going to begin with the first one. I'm going to place a motion on the table. Um, and the motion is to approve the change in polling location for precinct 1A from the North Zion Church to the North Amherst Library, beginning with the September 3, 2024 state primary until further notice. Second. Is there a second? I believe you seconded, Mandy Joe. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Kathy. My one comment is I think this is a great idea, Sue. So, and uh, for a variety of reasons you put in your memo already, including parking, but it's, it, it is a much smaller room than the current space, but I'm assuming you've looked at the flow of people through it and you can handle it. Um, so I think it, it overcomes one of the big disadvantages of the current site. And plus it's a gorgeous room and everyone should get to see it. It is beautiful. And, I went up there and, and toured the location and I was so excited because it was, you know, when you start making a list of pros and cons, there were no, there were no cons. They were all pros. And I says, this is a no brainer. So yeah, I'm excited. I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. Um, but yeah, the memo says everything, all the issues that we've had with the Zion church that we've had to deal with over the years and the new location would resolve all of those things. Okay. Are there any further questions from counselors? Seeing none, I'm going to begin the vote with myself and I, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelo. Aye. And uh, Councillor Ette. Aye. It's unanimous with one counselor absent. The next motion is to approve the warrant for the September 3, 2024 state primary election. For second. For posting. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Councilor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous with one absent. Sue, thank you for joining us. Pam, You're you welcome. have a question. Yes. Uh, question for Sue before she leaves. Yeah. I have asked if it is permissible for counselors to serve as uh, uh, at the voting booth, uh, voting poll places. And um, even if, I mean, if it's, if we're not on the ballot. 
It, it's not. I, I actually saw <clears throat> town manager's email and it's in the charter. I forget which section I looked it up. Um, you cannot hold a second position that earns money. And because election workers, yeah, election workers have to become employees, they earn money. So I'm afraid not. <laughs> I love the fact that you want to help though, but um, no. no. And yeah, I think it's a one year cooling off period as well. When you when you um, cease to be a yeah yeah so no <laughs> yeah Sue thank you for clarifying that issue I think uh, there are many of us that have asked and okay Sam, thank you you're welcome have a good rest thank of night thank, thank you. you for joining us yeah we're going to move on to the FY25 water and sewer rates and I just want to note that we're required to do a public comment period for this. Um, However, I'm going to place it in motion, seek a second, move to public comment, and then come back for the vote, okay? In accordance with general bylaw 3.62 water use regulations, having heard public comments specific to the proposed amendments on July 15, 2024, notice of which was posted on the town bulletin board for at least 10 days on June, June 21st, 2024, and notice of amendments published to the newspaper on July 1, 2024, to amend the water use regulation appendix as follows. By replacing the effective date of July 1, 2023 with July 16, 2024, by replacing domestic water rates of $5 per 100 cubic feet with domestic water rates $5.25 per, per 100 cubic feet, and by replacing agriculture water rates of $5 per 100 cubic feet with agricultural water rates of 5.25 per 100 cubic feet. Is there a second? Second. I, I want to also note that there is a second motion, and it says exactly the same thing, and it is regarding the sewer use regulations, okay? And in that case, again, we're replacing the date and the domestic sewer rate will move from 5.5, $5.50 per 100 cubic feet. And the domestic sewer rate um, will move to 5.85 per 100 cubic feet. So with that, I'm going to ask if there's any people in Zoom or in the audience who would like to make public comment. Point of, I guess I have a question. Yeah. Is this public comment for just water or is this for water and sewer? For water and sewer. Thank you for asking for the clarification. That's why I mentioned both of them. I'm looking for raised hands. Seeing none. I'm going to go back to the first motion, which has to deal with the water regulations. And did we have a second? Yes. Okay. Okay. Are there any other comments from counselors? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. It's unanimous with one absent. The second motion, in accordance with general bylaw 3.61 sewer use regulations, having heard public comment specific to the proposed amendment on July 15th, 2024, notice of which was posted on the town bulletin board for at least 10 days on June 21st, 2024, and amendments were published in the newspaper on July 1st, 2024, to amend the sewer use regulation Appendix A as follows. By replacing the effective date of July 1, 2023 with July 16, 2024, by replacing domestic sewer rate $5.50 per 100 cubic feet with domestic sewer rate $5.85 per 100 cubic feet. Is there a second? Second. Are there any comments or questions from counselors? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. Councilor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? 
Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. And Bob Hegner. Aye. That's unanimous with one absent. Um, second time. Uh, um, one more water and sewer motion. Oh, thank you. I knew I had to be missing something. To adopt approval order FY25-10 and order setting water and sewer rates to be effective July 16, 2024 as recommended by the Finance Committee report of June 14, 2024 and shown on page 13 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, then I'm going to move to Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelus. Aye. Uh, uh, Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. It is unanimous with one councilor absent. You have now performed your duties as commissioners of the water and sewer of Amherst. All right. Um, let me just check something. One second. Um, let's take a t um, nine minute break and be back at eight o'clock. Okay. Please turn off your mics and your videos and turn the video back on when you return. Yeah, it is. 
As you return, please turn your videos on. Up to view, yes, and go to gallery. The word view, it should be in the black part of the screen. Yeah. 
All right, we're going to continue. I just need to make sure. Um, Hala, are you back? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, everybody else is in the room. Thank you. So um, first of all, we're going, we're going to have a very brief discussion on the town manager's goals. Uh, you received a very lengthy set of spreadsheets I understand there may still be some corrections, but I don't think those corrections make a difference. Um, so thanks to all of you for responding. The goal of the spreadsheets is to um, compare pre-retreat and post-retreat, noting that post-retreat was two months after the retreat. The yellow shading were those goals that ranked the highest, sub-goals. And it includes um, both looking at the ranking and the average and also the X's and the slashes. The orange shading were those that ranked between 2.5 and 3. So they would be the next highest. We'll review that in a moment. The X's, if they were under your name, mean that for the first five top ranked sub goals, there's an X. For the next five ranked sub goals, there's just a slash. So I'm going to um, make a few observations. And then if you would like, we can actually review the sheets. The main thing I want us to do tonight is to identify areas where we feel as a council, we would like to have further discussion. Okay. So these are my observations. Um, there's not much difference between pre-retreat and post-retreat. Interestingly enough, things like schools and the library aren't even ranked high. It's because most of us think of them as being in process and so forth. Um, however, on another very serious note, there are items that the council has either taken action on or has under, under consideration that are not reflected in these goals. And yet they were reflected in carryover memos or they have consumed significant staff time, including things like speed limit and traffic common, the high school track, nuisance property, although it is considered part of rental registration, street lights, and obviously others I'm not remembering. And these are many other issues that staff must place priority that are not even in these goals. And they aren't part of our goals, but they are part of what the town has to do. And they include things like surveys of homes regarding sewer and water lines, which we heard about at the council meeting very recently. So my point is that as we review the goals for the coming year, I think we need to be realistic, inclusive, and at the same time, um, understand the demands that each of these goals place on our staff. Are there sub goals we would like to spend some time in future meetings discussing for the purpose of seeking greater clarification and some indication of how we might measure those sub goals? One of them that people have mentioned on a regular basis is the whole area of housing. So uh, the floor is open for discussion. We can actually go through the sheets if you really, really want to, but I think it's much more important for us to identify areas that we feel need further discussion. Mandy Jo, I mean, sorry, Councillor Hannigan. Hmm? <laughs> Councillor Hannigan. Um. This, the set of manager goals in my mind is a mishmash of things the council can do and things the council can't do. And a lot of what you just mentioned, Lynn, is things the council has to do that the manager can't really, because it's completely within the purview of the council. Speed limits, in some sense, is within our purview as keeper of the public way. Right. Um, street lighting is within our purview as keeper of the public way. It's not a manager goal. Um, we've directed the manager to do something. And so when I look at these goals and what's ranked highest, I look at what 
should the council discuss that should be a council priority? Um, and in particular, since I serve on CRC, I look at all the things that were ranked that relate to something CRC could be working on, some of which has been referred to CRC, solar bylaw in particular. It did not rank high on the counselor's lists though. What ranked higher was housing. And so I would love this council to really have a discussion on, I will give it sub goal number three of goal four, proposed measures to retain, promote, and increase home ownership opportunities for low and moderate income residents, including first time home buyers. It is the highest ranked goal, at least in sub goal within that goal, if not one of the highest ranked within the entire set of manager goals. But I have a feeling that there are 13 different opinions as to what those measures should be. And so I believe we need to have a discussion to help the manager and his departments determine what the measure should be that should be proposed. Thank you. Pam. Uh, and I was just going to say, if someone wants to be called in a meeting by some name or title, then it would be helpful to have your name changed on our screen so that we would know to call you by that. Thank you. Um, I was going to comment just on the one that you mentioned, which is the nuisance bylaw, and that has a direct effect on uh, some of the goals to promote and to enhance the quality of life in neighborhoods, to have strong neighbors, strong neighborhoods. And so I see that as very much part and parcel of that particular goal. It is not a non-priority. So you're specifically referring in this case to goal four point I don't have the number. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me. It's not up on the screen and I don't know the number off the top of my head. Well, goal four is the housing goal. And I'm trying to see what your... I think what you're referring to is goal three, number four, review and revise policies to support increased year round population in town. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Jennifer. Um, so also I, I had a question and a responding to picking up on what Councillor Haneke said about like CRC is now part of what we're very focused on is the solar bylaw, even though that, I'm not even sure that that's in the goals, but that was a town manager goal from a couple of years ago when we established the solar bylaw working group. So there's there's items that we have to be working on right, because we've been working on them and they are a priority. So I don't know how there so we have to realize when we talk about these right. goals, we still have other goals that we right. haven't checked off, finished. So both waste hauler and solar bylaw were in the original goals and they're still here and they're ranked, but they're not ranked high. And yet TSO is spending enormous amounts of time on waste hauler and um, CRC is spending a lot of time on solar. But how do we not, I and mean, we have, we appointed a solar bylaw working group. Mm -hmm. We have to follow that through. I mean, we can't drop it and they're, and they're, it was a priority to have a solar bylaw. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think it gets to once something's in motion, right. we tend not to target it as a priority because it's a given that it's in motion. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's that it's not a priority. Right. Pam, did you have further comments? I was gonna say exactly the same thing that, that once deemed in action or underway that then we get to focus on other priorities. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say one thing, if I, if I wasn't quite finished. Mm -hmm. So particularly, so with um, a number of these goals where we're trying to prioritize the sub goals, I was finding, you know, for particularly maybe in racial equity and social justice, it's hard to prioritize those sub goals. Mm -hmm. They're all important. So right, it, they're just all part of the whole. 
I think the challenge that is going to go back to GOL because they have to look at this and come forward with proposal for the coming year. Actually, Anna and I talked about that just today, having both looked at this. Councillor Haneke. So I want to disagree with both Jennifer and Pam. A goal could be a priority of a council two councils ago that is no longer a priority of this council because of membership turnover or because of changes at the state level and laws at the state level. For example, I'll say solar bylaw. There is so much going on at the state on how to regulate solar installations that I'm not sure we should be spending time here on that until the state stuff settles out because we might just be spinning wheels on something that becomes immediately illegal after we've spent three, four months on it because of what's going on at the state. And so as I watch what's going on at the state, I'm not sure right now is the time to be working on that or to be working and prioritizing solar when we might need to be prioritizing battery energy storage, which might actually be a lot more important than solar by law right now. Um, and so to generalize and say, well, counselors ranked it low because it's in process might be why you might have ranked it low, but it's not why I ranked it low. Um, other things might be ranked low by everyone because of that, but I'm not sure we can just generalize and say, once something's in process, we have to prioritize it because it was prioritized and it's in process. We can stop that process if it's no longer a priority of the council anymore. Um, and so maybe we have to have a discussion at the council level regarding some of these that are lower that the committees are spending a lot of time on, like solar and waste hauling, to see whether, given that they're low here, whether the staff time that is being spent on that or the council time is being spent on it is actually where the council wants to spend its time versus something else that should be, or that the council might want that committee to spend its time on. I want to see CRC spend its time on housing, not solar. Or one of the things you did suggest was redirecting toward the issue of battery storage. Yeah. Uh, Kathy. Um, I also think we need to distinguish with this, the title of this is town manager goals. You know, I think when we first come up with something, we're asking, him to organize staff to get to start something in motion. So the example of waste hauler, that has happened and now it's back in the council's lap. So the town manager can't do anything till we do something. So to, to me, when I had to rank these, it was like, what exactly would I want the town manager to do? So, and then when I get, so the one I work on, now only once a month, the elementary school building committee, it's out for bid. So it's not that it's not a high priority right. to bring that school home, but other than the town manager making sure that we're not pulling off the cliff on something we're supposed to do. And since we have a lot of administrative help at that, <laughs> you know, so it, it's like looking at a few of these things, it's not a low priority, it's just a low priority for action by the town manager. So I find this a very messy uh, piece. And then Jennifer, you said you find them all important. I find some of them, if I read two different ones, I can't tell the difference between them. So I th think we still have some duplicates. So I'm only gonna rank one high if I think the other is similar, You know, if I can't figure out what the difference is other than wording. So it's just a difference. So like waste haulers back in our lap, but if we really don't think it's a priority, we shouldn't be sending it back to staff either. So that that is a valid question. Andy? Yeah, I, I think that we also need to recognize that um, we're making decisions at times to refer issues to committees or uh, bylaws to committees or starting in on something and we're not recognizing either the amount of time that is required to be invested in it or the length of time that it will take to complete it 
And uh, so uh, one of the things that I think we as an entire council need to be thinking about is once we start something, whether it be waste hauler or solar or whatnot, are we wanting to make a commitment to it and are we in recognizing that it is a multi-year commitment that is being talked about and that it's not something that should come up for annual review once that decision is made, but the decision should not be made lightly at the time that it is originally referred because uh, we need to know that it's going to take a long time and a lot of time. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Lynn. With respect to Mandy Joe's comment, I think overall, uh, my experience is that it's kind of hard to distinguish or to come up to come up with conclusions about, uh, you know, what priorities we have as a council as a whole, mostly because we don't know the reasoning behind the ratings. And I think that that's really important. So just how Mandy Joe stated, like her reason behind rating things a certain way was different than why I rated them or other counselors. Um, also, um, I know for myself, because of the way goals split up with the progression over time, I think I also had some difficulty rating them and understanding how other counselors might be using the rating system. For example, we had certain goals that were then broken out into two goals. And I wasn't sure if like, I'm rating these now as two separate goals, or these are, you know, I don't know. I just think overall it was hard to come to or to make general conclusions about how we feel as a council as a whole. I do agree that we should have um, set aside time for conversations and hopefully decision making regarding our housing crisis, um, because not only is that a an issue that I think we all agree is facing man, many Amherst residents, but it's a it's a statewide nationwide issue at this point. And so we should be engaging in conversations around that topic at the council level. But I think that there are other initiatives that I also would like to engage in, but it's it's hard to say if I think overall as a council that those are our priorities. Um, so I'm not sure, I know we've, we've been moving along with this, but I'm not sure if we can sort of redo the rating scale to get a better idea or have a different way of just an active conversation of figuring out how to prioritize because the way that we're doing it right now makes it really hard for me to determine that outside of my own personal opinions. Okay, George. So I'll take a specific example, um, which may not be helpful, but it's one that's on my mind a lot and it's not as far as I can see in the goals. And, uh, but I think it's, I'm suspecting that it's something that others of you are thinking about related to um, quality of life, neighborhoods and um, home ownership. And that's the challenge of rental conversions, the challenge of properties being bought and becoming rental properties. It's a complicated issue. Um, I don't have any clear answers. Um, I'm open to further discussion and reflection but maybe I'm the only one or the only one or two that thinks this is something we need to, to, to help need help on. Um, we would need the help of the planning department. We would need to have a conversation about this issue. Um, but, and I hear it from some of my constituents um, and I sometimes hear it from some of my colleagues in conversation, but that's an example of what I consider to be a quality of life issue, neighborhood issue and ownership, home ownership issue that we just don't talk about. Um, and I don't have any answers, but I think it's an issue or problem that we need to address. So how does that fit into this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe I'm in, a, I'm, you know, so that's, that's a concrete example. Okay. So this is my takeaway from here. And that is that as we look at the agendas for August, September, and even into October, um, one of the discussions probably contained to like an hour would be around housing and quality of life, if you will, and year-round residents, kind of all fits into one. Another might be around whether or not solar should be really focusing on battery storage versus solar, because so much of what solar is going on at the state, as, Mandy, as Councilor Haneke mentioned. Um, and then the issue that I think many of you have raised is 
what is the con what is the commitment of the present council to earlier decisions that take multiple years to do and solar is certainly in that that group as well as um issues like um waste hauler uh and frankly neighborhoods quality of life etc i don't know that we um in fact the plan was not to spend any more time on this than to just look at it for the moment there's no perfect grading system i don't like this one but i can't come up with a better one i'm open to any suggestions and all uh but i think with that it would be best for us to move on okay um We're going to move on to um, town council appointments, okay? And the planning board appointments, I'm gonna call on Pam Rooney to briefly discuss any feedback from the... Um, CRC. Um, from CRC, thank you. Thank you. Um, there is an extensive report in your packet. And the summary of that is that we had three candidates for two positions. One of the positions was um, the, the end of a term for a person who wanted to be reappointed. And uh, the, the, the vote ended up um, supporting that person. Um, and then the second, the second opening was a a uh, close vote, a split vote um, between the five members of the of the committee. Uh, that said, the recommendation though is to move ahead with the appointment of Doug Marshall as the returning the returning candidate uh, to the planning board for a term starting right now uh, through the end of June 17, 2027. And secondly, to appoint Melissa Ferris to the planning board um, for the same term beginning immediately ending the end of June, 2027. And um, we followed procedures according to the charter and to the policies and um, followed step-by-step -step through the process as you are now all familiar with, with the multiple appointments and vacancies that we've been dealing with lately. Thank you. Okay, so let me begin by uh, placing the first of the two motions on the table and seeking a second to appoint Doug Marshall to the planning board for a term beginning immediately and ending June 30th, 2027. Is there a second? Second. 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 Okay, are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. It's unanimous with one absent. The second motion is to appoint Melissa Ferris to the planning board for a term beginning immediately and ending June 30th, 2027. Is there a second? Second. Change seconds. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there questions or comments? Counts, uh, George Ryan, Councilor Ryan. I would like to make a motion. I move to amend the existing motion and replace the name Melissa Ferris with the name Lawrence Klutz. Second. Thank you. Um, Okay, so the motion is a motion to amend. And so we need to deal with the amendment first and then the actual motion, correct? Thank you. So the motion is to amend and it, the amendment would be not the actual appointment, but the amendment. Um, George, would you please speak to your motion? Thank you. We are always grateful when residents step forward and offer themselves as candidates for town boards and committees. And this case is no exception. And we're all aware of the challenge at times at finding candidates for these vacancies. 
In this case, the planning board has two vacancies and there are three candidates. After the advertising is required on the town website and extensive outreach, the pool of three was declared sufficient by CRC. All three submitted SOIs, all three went through the interview process. My assumption is that my colleagues, as I have, have read the SOIs and have taken the time to view the interviews. The vote on CRC, as was mentioned by the chair, was divided, three in favor of one candidate and two favoring a second. But it's ultimately our responsibility to decide, based on the existing record, which candidate we think would be the strongest. And in this case, I think there's a stronger case to be made for Mr. Klutz over Ms. Ferris. In the fall, as part of the strategic partnership agreement signed between the town and UMass, a series of conversations will begin around three areas of common concern and interest, housing, infrastructure, and economic development. This is an extremely important conversation and one I think long overdue. I think it important that we see these conversations and this relationship not as an adversarial one or one that is a zero sum game, but as one grounded in mutual respect and a shared concern for the long-term viability and health of our town and the university. We are in this together. We need to stop seeing the university as quote, the problem unquote, stop using it as a convenient punching bag for problems and challenges that have a long and complex history and do not fit an easy us versus them narrative. I think Mr. Klutz, given his lived experience in a college town and his appreciation of the vital importance of a positive and healthy town gone relationship would strongly resist that narrative and be a more positive and productive voice on the planning board. Given the nature of the process that we as a council have created, where all questions are submitted in advance and there is no opportunity to seek clarification or probe more deeply into the SOI, I understand quite well the challenge you all face in making an informed decision. One is often left to reading between the lines and drawing inferences based on certain words or phrases. I have to say that personally, it sometimes reminds me of recent Supreme Court nominations where everybody's on their best behavior and they're careful not to say anything remotely controversial or substantive. You'll probably not be surprised to learn, and if you listen to the interviews you did learn, that during the, the interviews, all the candidates were in support of affordable housing. What that phrase actually meant to them was left unaddressed and unexamined. All, not surprisingly, thought that public comment and input was important, but only one candidate, the, currently serving, the one currently serving on the body, pointed out that in the vast majority of cases, public comment and input comes from a very few number of voices, the same voices, who often say the same things over and over and over again. In point of fact, the planning board rarely, if ever, hears from a diverse and more representative set of voices, probably in many cases because they can't afford to buy or rent here and are invisible and voiceless. And then there's the phrase family housing, which was repeated repeatedly, was, was came up repeatedly, particularly from Ms. Ferris. She's in favor of more family housing. Well, who's opposed to family housing? But again, what that actually means and how one might actually begin to go about realizing that was left unexamined and unquestioned. There is, fortunately or unfortunately for Ms. Ferris, a public record that does exist that you should be aware of, a written comment to the council in February 2023, in which she expressed concern that Mr. Marshall serves on the planning board and is currently its chair, and because he's employed by UMass as a planner. She asked rhetorically in her comment to the council, quote, how can Mr. Marshall serve two often conflicting interests at the same time, unquote. She went on to write, as a resident of Amherst, Mr. Marshall is certainly welcome to serve on any number of other boards and committees, but as a matter of town policy, planners, while in the active employee of UMass, should not be allowed to serve on our planning board, particularly as its chair. Not only should he recuse himself from the board, but measures should be put in place that prevent people with such obvious conflicts of interest from serving on the planning or zoning board. This should be self-evident, end quote. No, it is in fact not self-evident. In fact, I could not find a statement with which I disagree more. Councillor Taub is correct to remind us that our peculiar demographic, where roughly 60% of our population is student age, creates a very unique challenge to this town, particularly in the area of housing. I don't know what the answers are, but I do know that making the university into the villain is not the right approach. 
portraying this relationship as one defined by an essential conflict of interest and as a zero sum game is in my view, both factually wrong and also destructive of the very relationship we're trying to nurture with the university. We need to work together to address the challenges we face. It is certainly not that we're always in agreement or that there are not areas of tension, but it's precisely in those areas and on those topics that we need to approach each other with respect and a sense that we will not resolve these issues, particularly in housing, with this sort of attitude or rhetoric. I think Mr. Klutz, both in his SOI and in his responses to the interview questions, understands this and would be a more positive and productive voice on the planning board. So I hope you will support his candidacy and my amended motion. Kathy? I disagree with George. Um, I watched the video of the interviews for both and read the SOIs, and that is what we're supposed to be basing um, our information on. And I think uh, the committee did a very good job that Ferris is a very interesting candidate. She has been attending planning board meetings and watching. She knows how to read architectural drawings. She is um, has done layout. She has a, a, a history of working with groups in a leadership position, um, not always um, in agreement. And she, uh, interestingly, although she didn't uh, uh, emphasize it, brings some diversity to the committees. And we supposedly have been looking for that. Um, I think it would be unfortunate to search the press for comments that people have made, um, especially when issues are uh, close to people's heart. Uh, I looked at, at the other candidate, and I think he's clearly, I, you know, I would like him to serve on committees. He did not express as much of having re been a regular listener to the planning board. There's a lot of learning um, on this. So I think it, she is a very strong candidate, so I don't support the amendment. I'm also curious, Lynn, on what the rules are, because I'm often cut off if I speak too long and can't read a long statement. So um, I won't speak any longer than this, but I, I think the committee did deliberative and thoughtful action, and so I will not support the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Haneke? I do support the amendment. Um, one of the reasons I supported Mr. Klutz over Ms. Ferris at CRC is because of their approach to incorporating public comment. Ms. Ferris indicated that she would absolutely incorporate public comment into any decision made and that those most directly affected should be heard and strongly considered almost to the exclusion of the rest of the town. She didn't add the almost to the exclusion of the rest of the town. She had the rest, but the implication was that if you're in a butter, your opinion matters more than anyone else in town. That was her implication. Mr. Klutz in the meantime said that public opinion alone cannot dictate board's work. These are, these are from my notes. Important it's an important contributing factor, but ultimately decisions need to be based on sound policy and long-term considerations. He had, in my mind, the appropriate recognition that public comment is not the be-all, end-all of a decision you need to make on the planning board, particularly because the public is not fully represented at planning board meetings. The other part from Mr. Klutz's comments and answers to questions that I thought was extremely important was his knowledge of the master plan, his knowledge and how he spoke to waivers and um, waivers and exceptions and how he said things like, you need to look at whether that waiver is necessary to do something that would be in support of a master plan. And he also looked at the long-term view. If we're constantly seeing requests for waivers or exceptions or special permits on the same matter of the zoning bylaw, that maybe we need to change the zoning bylaw because as 
Doug Marshall said, the zoning bylaw tends to lag behind the master plan and is set in stone and doesn't get changed very often. And when you're looking at waivers and exceptions and application to zoning bylaw, things change over the course of time. And if you're constantly seeing a need to, and granting that exception, not just seeing the requests, but if the planning board or the ZBA is constantly granting a specific exception, whether it be to parking or whether it be to building height or whether it be to something in some area, um, lot coverage, maybe it's a problem with the zoning bylaw because times have changed. And Mr. Klutz's recognition and acknowledgement and knowledge of that duty of the planning board to me was extremely important in my reasoning for why to, why I believed he was the better appointment to the planning board. He seemed to have a more comprehensive knowledge of what the planning board does and how it actually operates from a regulatory point of view than Ms. Ferris. Andy. Yeah, this is a, particularly difficult appointments uh, and it, 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 when we look at it and we recognize that it was a three to two vote, we have to recognize as a council that it was not a resounding recommendation of a committee. It was a split decision of a committee and that we as a council have to all take responsibility for the kind of analysis that is being presented tonight. And I appreciate that we are having that opportunity. I want to throw in just one minor thing and then just go on to the um, major point. And the minor thing is that when the uh, uh, SOIs were placed in the packet for tonight's meeting, I noticed that Mr. Klutz's was not included. And I had to go back to the planning board, or, or excuse me, to the CRC um, packet in order to get that SOI back out. And that, given the circumstances, I think that was an awkwardness that just should be noted. Um, but I think that there were two things that, in the end, when I did go back and spend the time listening to the discussion that happened at the meeting and as much of the interview as I had time to do. And uh, it, it boiled down to a couple of things. That, one is that uh, what, uh, the, uh, what George Ryan had uh, indicated, had read to us, I, found, I remembered exactly when we received that public comment. I did not attach it to Mr. Ferris, but I do recall it. And I do recall that I was really questioning uh, the judgment that was behind it for the very reasons that were being explained. Um, it, it would seem to me, in addition, that when I found out and realized that it was the person who would be expected to be placed on the planning board along with Mr. Marshall, that that in and of itself raised an additional question. But the major reason that I came down to it is when you get down to the SOI uh, that Mr. Klutz had put in, the paragraph that said to me the most was this one, having familiarized myself with the goals outlined in Amherst's uh, comprehensive plan, I'm particularly drawn to initiatives aimed at promoting economic vitality, environmental stewardship, transportation infrastructure, and community engagement. These goals are vital to building a diverse and inclusive community and preserving the town's natural resources, priorities that resonate deeply with me and mirror my own values. That was quite a statement and against one that came from uh, Ms. Ferris, which was concerned about family housing. That was the, the driving force. Uh, if we don't think about things like economic vitality, uh, we are not going to end up 
with a town where we can afford to do all of the other things, including uh, preserving our neighborhoods and um, providing the education that will draw people to pay the kind of money that they have to pay. So for all of those reasons, I think that the clarity of his statement about what the value is that needs to be considered by the planning board seemed to me to be the much better state. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> Uh, yes, I, I don't know where to start first. Um, one of the first things I would say, because uh, I think something well, was said about, I, I don't want to take, I. they were all, um, the two new candidates, Melissa Ferris and um, Mr. Klutz were both excellent candidates. So I voted for and I'm supporting Ms. Ferris, but that's not because I don't think Mr. Klutz, it, it, it reflects, um, you know, no disregard for Mr. Klutz or the responses that he provided. But just so <clears throat> the council knows, um, Melissa Ferris grew up um, in uh, Northampton. She, her father was spent his faculty at UMass. She's currently an enrolled full-time student at UMass. So she knows the ver area very well and she's very familiar and supportive of the university and, you know, I think considers it an extension of her home. She's also, um, there is a woman who is member of the planning board who is transitioning off. So she would be, you know, just in terms of that diversity, she's a woman and of Middle Eastern descent. So I uh, also could, um, include that in her background. I, um, I pick my battles, so I, did vote um, for Mr. Marshall. Um, I, uh, what, excuse me? No, I abstained during the committee, but I voted for him tonight. I did vote for him tonight. I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Marshall um, and his commitment to the town, but I don't think the concern that someone who is, and it has nothing to do with anybody personally, but I think having the concern that a senior planner for the university it's maybe should not serve as a planning board chair is, <laughs> uh, Councillor Ryan's eyes just popped out. I think that is, that is a concern that she has every right to express as other, we received other letters from member of the, of the public on that. And I once wrote um, an op-ed in response to a statement that um, was made at the February 15th, 2023 planning board meeting by the um, planning board chair when he said, we have a shortage of housing for students and a shortage of housing for middle income and worker housing. We can't solve the second, the shortage of middle income and worker housing without dealing with the first one. I feel like we're behind on providing housing for students in this town that it, and so it could actually be a while before we see improvement in the worker housing and the middle income housing availability just because there are so many students that have housing demands that are unmet. And that's, we can agree or, you know, we, we could have a real conversation about that. I don't personally think it's the responsibility of the town to provide all the unmet student housing needs that a good part of that responsibility lies with the university. And perhaps, you know, and that's where wearing two hats might give the perception of a conflict of interest. So I don't think that um, Ms. Ferris or anybody else that wrote to the council should be demon demonized for expressing that concern. So, um, and I think to characterize Ms. Ferris as being, there was, there was nothing that was said during the interview that, um, that would suggest that she has a particular agenda. And I am concerned that you know, she, nobody's here to defend themselves that they're being um, mischaracterized. And again, I think that they were, I have no, um, I'm not disparaging in any way. I thought that both candidates um, were dedicated to the town, were very thoughtful, provided very well thought, or, you know, articulate responses to the questions. But I don't think that we should um, kind of demonize um, and mischaracterize someone who's not here to frankly, you know, kind of defend herself. And I do... So I voted for Ms. Ferris because I think that we could only pick two of three good candidates and that I thought she also brought some uh, 
diversity to the planning board and has a real understanding of the town of Amherst because she, she grew up here. Pat, and, I'm sorry. Student and is a current student at UMass. Thank you. Pat? I voted uh, for Lawrence Klutz. You need to speak to your phone. There you go. Okay. Speak to your mic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I supported Mr. Klutz as the candidate. Um, I had very uh, reasons that have been stated by other people, uh, by Andy, by Mandy, by George. Um, but when he was of the three candidates, he was the only one who really talked about inclusivity, um, di uh, diversity. Uh, he really uh, was looking to create a community where all voices could be heard and have effect on policy. He has strong experience in strategic planning. Um, and he, he stated in his essay, a holistic approach that takes into account the diverse needs and perspectives of all members of the community. And that Miss Ferris did not do. She did talk about, oh, I think maybe we should, uh, we could lower some of the zoning requirements uh, for some housing and meaning of probably affordable housing. Um, I don't have the direct quote here. Um, and I'm not trying to demonize her. I have a lot in common with her. We both went to college in our 40s. Um, but she also got involved with the planning board meetings and wanting to attend planning board because she was opposed to a duplex development that was going to be built near her neighborhood. Um, and she talks about, in her SOI, she talks about... Um, she learned about the housing crisis and and uh, she can see that there are developers with vested interests um, in helping create more housing in Amherst. And while the stated intent of many involved is to attract families back to town, much of the new housing stock is clearly being aimed only at students. I'm concerned about the democratic cliff that ex experts predict will lower enrollment. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, the housing is not being in a way that appeals to families. Abutters have a stronger voice, according to Ms. Ferris, than the master plan, than policy, than uh, income level. Um, and that really concerns me because if it were up to, and I will take an example of 132 Northampton Road, a, a project that has branded me in my understanding or scarred me in my understanding of how Amherst works. If we had listened to the abutters, instead of looking at the need for affordable housing, instead of looking at um, the ability to support people who were at the economic bottom uh, support people coming out of homelessness, support young people who are working two or three jobs and are couch surfing. We would not have East Gables, which has blends into the neighborhood, contrary to what the abutters were saying, and really addresses housing for a mixed group of people, with 70% of that housing being earmarked in the initial round for Amherst residents. If we had listened, and so one of the strongest things Mr. Klutz did was to take a risk, not cover up his words or his ideas, but he took a risk. Yes, we have to listen. We have to listen to more than one part of the community, but the diverse community. And yet the board must make a decision that is the best decision for the town. East Gables was the best decision for Amherst. Thank God it was taken. And I really I, feel strongly, I like Miss Ferris, but I feel really strongly that it is important to have people on the count, uh, planning board who aren't there for only one reason, which is to protect 
themselves. We are bigger than that in so many ways. George. I resisted the urge to make a point of order, um, and I hope I was right, but I really ask my colleagues to be careful in their choice of words. I am not demonizing anyone, and I'm not disparaging Ms. Ferris. I disagree very strongly with some things that she has written, and I'm responding to things that she said in a public meeting, but I'm not demonizing her, and I object in the strongest possible way to that language. I'm not disparaging her personally. Um, that's not my point, and I think I've made that pretty clear. What I'm concerned about is an attitude. What I'm concerned about is a perspective. And I'm, as I said in my remarks at the beginning, we are entering into an important series of conversations. Um, we have a chancellor who's interested in a positive town town relationship, and I'm looking for people to sit on the planning board who are at least open to that conversation and do not characterize the university in the way that she has characterized it in some of her statements and comments. And I will end with a brief comment that she does make in writing in the SOI. She describes our town as, quote, a town that is filled with no frills housing that rings campuses. That's not a description of Amherst that I recognize. Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> I, I probably overstated using the word demonizing, but I feel I do stick with, I, I think that Ms. Ferris is being disparaged and there's innuendo. We have, we don't know what her position is on 132 Northampton Road. I mean, to imply that she would have opposed it. We have, why would we, why would we assume that? Um, I do have to say, so uh, Ms. Ferris does live in, a, a neighborhood that zone general residence. That's the only zoning in Amherst, which has it's she chose to live in a neighborhood that has all kinds of housing, single family housing, duplexes, triplexes, townhouses and apartments. It's the part of town that zoned for the smallest lots. So she lives in maybe the most diverse housing, which in a neighborhood where infill is already being practiced. I happen to know that she lives adjacent to a triplex. It's a three unit, 10 students border her property. As far as I know, she has no issue with that. There was a proposal, which you, you referenced the proposal that she objected to, and that was to build a, in the backyard where that triplex that's rented to 10 students, it's, I mean, the owner's very clear, it's not to provide workforce or family or, or multifamily housing for anyone. It is rented by the bedrooms to, for students. The proposal was to build four additional units behind that with 16 bedrooms for students, the developer said, so there would be 26 students living on a small lot um, in a, surrounded by residential houses that were, you know, narrow, all cheek and jowl together. So she was one of the, the neighbors that may have um, expressed a concern about that, of having, that would have been 34, no, it would have been 26 students at probably $1,200 a bedroom because it's very close to the campus. And that's a perfectly, you know, that's why we have a planning board. So that residents can um, express comments to the planning board. And I don't think they should be, um, it should be held against them that they took advantage of the opportunity and the right they have of residents of Amherst to offer public comment to one of our uh, permanent granting authorities. And I think we would all do that if 30 students were gonna be living on the other side of our small lot on the other side of our backyard fence uh, on a, in a proposal with 22 parking spaces. The so again, I think that there's, I, I, I concerned that we are, putting words into candidates' mouths when we don't know what position they would take on um, it, on projects that never that we've never asked them about and that have never come before them for deliberation. Motion that's on the table is to move to amend the existing motion by replacing the name Melissa Ferris with the name Lawrence Klutz. The motion's been made and seconded. Seeing no other hands, we're going to move to a vote. Kathy Shane. No. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. No. Councillor Walker. No. 
Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Councilor Ette. Abstain. Then Griesmer is an abstention. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Abstain. Councilor Lord. Nay. Pam Rooney. No. Point of order. Yes. I did not understand Councilor Lord's vote. It was unclear to me whether it was yay or nay. Councilor Lord. Sorry. Please. Thank you. It was a nay as in no. Okay. Pam Rooney. No. Councilor Ryan. Aye. So it's four in favor, five nays, and three abstains. Uh, the motion fails. how Miss Ferris would vote on 132 Northampton Road. I said if her belief okay. that I, the butters carry more weight than others, then we would not have 132 Northampton Road. So I don't like that you say something that I said and twist it by accident. I think. Thank you. We're we're done with it. Disappointed in this vote. Stain. Thank you. Um, I'm more than glad to explain my decision to abstain. We're back to the original vote to appoint Melissa Ferris to the planning board for a term beginning immediately and ending June 30th, 2027. We begin with Kat, uh, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That motion was seconded. Yes. Uh, yes, I seconded it. Yeah. Councillor Ette, you have your hand up before we move to votes. Are we not having a discussion on? Sure. Okay. I'm sorry. The, yes, the floor is open for discussion. Are there any comments on the motion that's now on the floor, which is the original motion? Councilor Ette. Um, I'd like to explain my abstention. I. I think deference should be given to committees that nominate candidates to the council. I do recognize that it was a 3-2 vote and it was split. But even that split still at some level should have some kind of deference. In my original remarks at that meeting, I did mention that I couldn't really distinguish between Farris and Klotz. And in fact, one of the reasons that I gave, although that isn't primarily the reason why I went one way or the other, was that Klotz had mentioned that he was open to being in some other committees in town. Now, that's partially my fault because not all committees are created equal in town. But again, I'm returning to the fact that when you have a committee who has handled an interview and listened to the candidates, a little difference, not um, maybe a blank check should be given to them. Now, if the votes were going to be held today, my vote might be different, but given my inclination, I think it is appropriate in the case of the amendment to abstain. George? I cannot overemphasize how important this body is. It's one of the reasons that it is our decision to make. So I'm deeply disappointed in the decision by three of my colleagues to abstain. They should either stand up or sit down. This is an extremely important body. We have a vital relationship with the university. And I, while I'm repeating myself, well, I'll stop. But um, I don't, there's a reason why we are called to make this judgment. Uh, deference to a committee 
If this were four to one or five zero, that would carry some weight with me. But this was a deeply divided vote. And uh, it's still not clear to me what the reasoning is for why the third vote was the third vote. So I'm going to vote no, and I am done. Jennifer? Um, <clears throat> Council Ryan again mentioned how important our relationship with the university is, which it is, but there was nothing that Ms. Ferris said that would in any way suggest she does not want to work in partnership with the university. She did mention that her father spent his career at UMass and that she is a student at UMass and chose to live two blocks from the campus. She is very connected to the university. She is not, there was nothing she said that would in any way indicate an adversarial relationship and nothing but a very positive relationship with the university. Councillor Haneke. Councillor Jennifer Taub deftly ignores the public comment Ms. Ferris wrote to us that Councillor Ryan talked about a year ago. I'm going to vote no. I want to address the deference regarding committees, and I agree deference should be given to committees on a lot of things, including potentially this one, except when those committees are deeply divided. As Councillor Ryan said, five zero, four zero, four one. But a three two vote could go any way depending on which five councillors are on that committee. And I think we need to recognize that. It's why our committees do not make the appointments or pass the bylaws. It's why the whole council makes the appointments and passes the bylaws. So in my five and a half years on a council, when I've had questions about a bylaw or an appointment, or an approval of appointment by a town manager where maybe I, my initial decision or my initial thought was to say no, and the committee comes in with five zero, yes, I definitely give it deference because they spent the time. But if that committee comes in three, two, I'm looking at that saying, well, that was deeply divided. And maybe my initial thoughts haven't been resolved at the committee level. And so I respect the, the deference, but at the same time, we were all voted in to vote our own best judgment in light of what a recommendation might be, not in full deference to that recommendation. Councilor Ache. I believe Andy hasn't spoken yet. True. Andy? Yeah, I, um, on the question of committees, it's not just about appointments, it's about all committees. I mean, we, we do spend a lot of time in committees of uh, making recommendations, but in the end, it is the council that owns the final decision. And I think we as counselors have to respect our colleagues who spent the time on issues and developed it, developed our set of recommendations. But in the end, it doesn't substitute for our responsibility to think through each one. And that's why I spent, you know, several hours this afternoon listening to as much of the uh in a CRC interview meeting as I could and uh, tried to and went back and uh, made sure that I read all three of the SLIs, including the one that was not in the packet for today's meeting, and uh, tried to exercise uh, independent judgment, including um, as part of that investigation, of course, reading the CRC report and having listened to the CRC discussion. So I, it is um, what it is, but I think that not just on appointments, but on all things, I hope that each of us takes the responsibility to really consider very carefully um, what it is that we were voting on because we are voting as a council and we have responsibilities as counselors for each vote we take. With that, I might say that I'm gonna 
I originally had given one vote. I am not going to stick with that vote that I had started to make previously. I, I'm sorry, so, Andy, we could not hear you. In that la uh, before we got into discussion, I had indicated I was asked to make the, um, a vote, and I want to have an opportunity to revote that. I don't want that vote to be recorded. As I got well. it. Thank you. Councillor Ette. I don't think that a committee vote should pro forma pass through the council. I don't believe that that's the point that I made, but simply that there's more work done on the council level, and at least that should be recognized in some way. Um, I would also like to speak, maybe this is tangential to the discussion, but I think it relates. This may be a reason why we should have more candidates for positions so we don't run into this kind of situation. When you have two and you bring three, then you will end up in these kind of votes. If you have five, what may end up happening is that the votes get dispersed and then there is some kind of convergence and you may not reach this position even if, let's take a step back. This is more or less what we are thinking about in Massachusetts when we speak of some kind of ranked voting. So um, I would like to lay the blame on the fact that we didn't allow as many candidates as possible and I would also use the opportunity to speak to members of the town to throw their hats in the ring so that this doesn't occur. In addition to that, however, this particular vote runs the risk of chilling people from mm -hmm. going for positions because then the possibility is that you may have said something that would put you in one camp or the other, or more unluckily, you may have said nothing at all, in which case, no one wants you. So, um, I rest my case. Thank you. My vote tonight was not inconsistent with my past vote on planning board members when there became a controversy, and it sounded as if we were actually trying to conduct an interview without the candidate being in the room. And so inferences get made. I don't think that's appropriate. And in the process, it leaves me with a feeling that we have just held a discussion. We have held an interview, but the candidate was not in the room. I personally object to that. And um, I, I certainly would have my preference, but that's my objection. Jennifer? Yeah, you've probably heard from me enough tonight, but I, I very much agree with uh, Councillor Ette that if we had ha we we really need more candidates. So I, I don't, and we, that may be a conversation we want to have. I really reached out to people in mm -hmm. different districts, mm -hmm. and this is a tough committee. It's time consuming, and so it I nobody that um, I did not reach out to anybody who submitted an application because I was really looking at uh, at districts that I don't live in. Um, so it's a challenge and we should maybe address why it, it seems to be so challenging. But I would also say that CRC, which I think is, is it's a very good thing that we have very, we really represent diverse perspectives and opinions on the council. So that's one reason you don't always see a five to zero. The positive side is we really, we really discuss things and that's, you know, it's good to have for everybody in town can feel, like, well, a lot of people in town can feel like their points of view are represented on CRC. Councilor Ryan. The reason that you have to draw inferences and read between the lines is because of the process that we've created in which one can't ask questions. It's all a dog and pony show. They have the questions in advance and they know what they are and you can't ask a follow-up. You can ask, can't ask for, for clarification. So what am I supposed to do? It seems I'm left with simply having to approve whatever the three-two vote happens to be. 
and that is utterly absurd. I have a responsibility to my constituents and to the town to make the best judgment I can based on the information available. And since we've chosen a process that doesn't allow us to ask people questions and to get clarification, I have nothing else to do but look at whatever written record exists and to examine the SOI as carefully as I can and to listen to the interviews. I did all three of those things, and I still stand by my decision. The superior candidate is Mr. Klutz. Councillor Haneke. With all due respect to the president, that abstention and the reason for it implies that all discussion about candidates at the council level is inappropriate because we never have the councillors, the candidates here. And so I would request from the president, if the president believes that we should not be having discussion because it's inappropriate to do so outside of having the candidates here, that the president present to the council a new, a new policy that does not put the president in the position of essentially needing to abstain because they feel the discussion is out of order. Accept that criticism. Um, George, do you still have a comment? Okay. All right. The motion is on the floor to appoint Melissa Ferris to the planning board for a term beginning immediately and ending June 30th, 2027. We begin with Andy Steinberg. No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Councillor Ette. Abstain. Lynn Griesmer is a no. Councillor Haneke. No. Bob Hegner. No. Councillor Lord. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. No. Kathy Shane. Yes. The vote is five in favor, seven opposed, one absten one absent. Six opposed, one abstention, and one absent. The motion fails. Uh we uh committee and liaison reports. Um, CRC. Yes. Does this mean that the CRC must open up the floor for a new, a new planning board interview to fill the remaining vacancy? Is that how I understand this vote? That would be my interpretation, but I'm certainly willing to listen to other people's thoughts. Councillor Walker. What a, what a waste of time. Mm. Councillor Walker. Um, I was going to ask a very similar question um, to, to Pam Rooney, but just with the follow-up that if we have to reopen and start the process over, are we still allowing the two candidates at question to re-submit to the process? Or does this mean like we are not... They are absolutely, we would never bar anybody from applying. Okay, thank you. Councillor Haneke. At the risk of being called out of order, I'm going to make a motion to, um, to appoint Lawrence Klutz to the planning board for a term beginning immediately and ending June 30, 2027. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. I want to postpone that. I think it's outrageous. We took a vote uh, to come back and swing around. Um, just, uh, uh, I want to wait till next, uh, a month from now. So I'm going to use my right to postpone. Motion, uh, councillors used their right to postpone. That postpones this to our meeting on the 19th of August. Point of order. Yes. So does this mean that the planning board sits with the vacancy for another month until That's until right. we even come around to a clear decision on this so that the CRC has a clear path to move forward? 
I believe that if the motion is tabled until the next meeting, it means there is that seat goes unfilled. Councillor Haneke, you have your hand up. She took it down. Jennifer? So that means the motion could be voted on without, so councillors could vote to appoint someone just, I don't know, based on, they won't have the opportunity, so that, it, it's not that it goes back to CRC to decide what to do, the motion right. could just come up and it could, so somebody okay. could be. There's, a, two, there's two ways. The, somebody from the prevailing side could have brought it up and, and in this case, the prevailing side was the no's and the, uh, no, the, um, the prevailing side. It's not side a motion to reconsider. Huh? This is not oh, a motion to not reconsider. A, I'm sorry, you're correct. It was not a motion to reconsider. It was a motion to just put it on the table. Thank you. Uh, I believe that it's that it's been placed on the table and then it was objected to and postponed and so the seat remains open until the 19th of August. That would be my interpretation. Do you have any other ideas, either Paul or Athena? No, nope. Mandy's, uh, Andy? Councillor Haneke's motion will be on the floor at the August 19th meeting. Right. Andy? I just actually have a question for uh, Athena. Was there a second on the motion and who was it? Yes. Yes, there was. It was D'Angelo's. Councilor Ethe. From my understanding, it isn't that the vacancy will be filled on the 19th. The 19th is when we'll have the votes with the possibility that that vote might not pass. And so it could extend even longer than that. That is true. And so if that's the case, given the possibility that we aren't barring anyone from going through the process again, would it be possible for the motion to be withdrawn so that we can have this process start? That would be up to the counselor that made the motion. And I'm not seeing her raise her hand. Point, point of order. Yes. My understanding is if someone defers this or, or postpones a vote, that we can't even discuss it? That's correct. We can't discuss the candidate, if you will. We can certainly clarify, ask questions to clarify what happens next. And that's what I see this as. Okay. Jennifer? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is part of what um, Councillor Ette was um, addressing, but it's not like anyone else can apply in the interim. No, that's yeah. correct. Okay. A point of clarification. Um, Councilor Tab asked if anyone can can apply in the interim. Those you, you people can apply anytime, but it, it, they can apply anytime, but if they don't apply when there's a vacancy posted, then it's not taken so that the chair would check if any of the applicants to be not, not to be considered on the 19th. Okay. Pam. I have a question for Athena. So when the bulletin board notice was posted, we did not end it at June 30th. We extended it and I don't know how long you extended it. The pool is closed when the SOIs are posted. Okay. It's, it, yeah. So that, that kind of ends that application process for the time being. The Anyone can apply at any time, so we can continue to accept state um, community activity forms. Um, but the CRC process, as detailed in the poly the council's policy on making recommendations to multiple member bodies, states that um, the applications have to come in after the vacancy notice is posted. Any before that are still valid, but the chair has to confirm that those people are still interested once the vacancy notice is posted. Okay, are we ready to move on? Uh, committee reports, a CRC, Pam Rooney. I think you just had our report, thank okay. you. 
elementary school building, Kathy? We we have a meeting this Friday, but the main thing to report is the bids went out. Um, and so now we're holding our breath. Um, you know, so they're due back in late August. There will be, um, well, I'm forgetting the exact date, but there was an opportunity to come and do interviews, uh, get more information, and I'm not sure whether people took up on it. Okay. Finance committee? Uh, nothing new. GOL is Anna or Councillor Ette. We have a meeting this Thursday. Yes. Um, I can mention only because I talked to Athena, I mean to Anna. Uh, we will vote on the finance committee appointments on recommendation to the council. Uh, we will um, probably begin the discussion about the reparations uh, follow-up committee. Those are the two items. She needs to uh, solidify that agenda by tomorrow morning, if I'm correct. Um, Jones Library, town manager. Oh, actually, Jones. you know what? Jones Library is Pam. Jones Library Building Committee is Building Pam. Building Committee, I'm sorry, Pam. Not not trustees. Um, the, the Building Committee met on June 9 to discuss with the architect the um, proposed cuts to materials and and configuration of, of uh, interior construction. There were two pieces of information that were very surprising that were new to the committee, uh, at least to some of the committee. One was the information that the mass tax credit of approximately $1.8 million had been denied back in April, and it was it was absolutely news to me. I think that makes a huge difference in the amount of money that the that the friends and the um, fundraisers now have to make up. Secondly, that uh, it came as a surprise, and maybe I hadn't understood completely, but the option there was no option being pursued by the architects to to um, not pull off and discard the historic woodwork, but instead to cut around the woodwork and save it. So several of us, two, at least two of us, had thought that there were going to be two options pursued relative to the uh, the integrity of the historic woodwork. But there is, in fact, only one option being pursued, and that is to pull off all historic woodwork and replace it with some off-the-shelf something, um, except for the main hallway, the, the main entrance, and the five or six um, fireplace mantles that are in the building. The rest would be removed and disposed of. Um, town services and outreach, Andy. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say much because we've already had substantial discussion about the, uh, uh, committee and what it's, uh, doing and appreciate the questions that are coming in from you. We have two meetings scheduled as been previously noted in the announcements at the beginning of this meeting that are prior to the next council meeting in August, and they are on July uh, 25th and on August 15th. So we will have two opportunities to uh, work on um, the questions that you have posed, which are very good questions, supplement the information that we have previously provided, and. Uh, I think that's pretty much where we are. Okay. Liaison reports. Seeing none. Uh, we've already approved the minutes. Town manager's report. Paul, any highlights? Yeah, thank you. So first I want to mention that uh, Melissa Zawadzki has begun her job as finance director. She started on July 1st and uh, has jumped in with both feed and has, continues to work with our finance officers as well. So really great to have her on board. Um, also the superintendent of schools began her work. She came on her second day, she came to one of our department heads meetings and introduced herself, which was really well received. Uh, she even came to a cup of Joe on last Friday, which was one of the best attended uh, events we've had with probably over 30, 30 people there. 
and she's just been um, really communicative and uh, really a quick learner in, from my observation so far. Um, also, we had, if you recall, we had a 911 outage, which came at a pretty challenging time because, um, you know, this is a statewide outage. We had nothing to do with it, but we had to respond to it. And so we had a new communications, uh, our, our communication center director had uh, retired. So we had someone uh, in the acting role, Jason Rush, Rushford, and he did a spectacular job. Um, and we also had uh, an acting fire chief, Lindsey Stromgren, and our new police chief, Gabe Ting, and our new communications manager, Sam Gifford and um, Giffen. And so, but it, we, it, it was really a, um, we, we did a after action meeting on that and debriefed everything. And just, we, we found some things that we could do better in terms of communication, but overall, I think our team with IT as well, responded really well to that. Um, a shout out to our um, recreation department and all the, so many departments helped in the, in the fireworks on July 2nd. It was a gorgeous night. I know some of you were there. Um, it was um, just a really terrific, um, well-organized and credit to um, Becky Demling from the recreation department and, and Ray Harp for the work that they've done. And also we all wanted to sort of re publicly recognize the contribution that the university made there was a list of about 40 people who have contributed time to help to organize from the UMass Police Department to the, mm -hmm. the facilities department, to the electrician, uh, to custodians who were there until midnight, making sure the bathrooms were clean for the next day. Uh, the university really devotes, uh, they don't just give us the space. They dedicate a lot of staff to helping that be a success. So I just want and I have thanked public, I have thanked the, the um, chancellor uh, and all of his staff. So I, I wanted to do that publicly as well. And also, while we're in the this is a sort of a thank you sort of thing, I want to just uh, also thank Doug Slaughter, who was the interim uh, school superintendent for over a year. And that was not an easy task for him. It's something that he didn't have to say yes to, but he really um, stewarded the um, the school department through some really challenging times. And he was very glad to hand the reins over to the superintendent. Um, but I just want to thank him publicly as well, because um, that was an important role for him to play during in, in crucial time during the town's governance. So, and I'm here for any questions or if you can talk to me afterwards. Questions or first. comments? I'll make only one and that was, there were 43 people in the room on Friday at the Cup of Joe. You lost count, Paul. Yes, Jennifer. Um, more refresher, I think. We were talking about the War Memorial Pool at the last council meeting. Mm -hmm. And where did we leave that? Because I actually received some, uh, I received several emails from constituents who are very, just to, you know, had listened in on that discussion and wanted to pass the word along that they really value the pool. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure what, uh, where the, con where people felt they were closing the pool. That was not part of the conversation. What we were talking about is the bathhouse needs to repair. When we went out to get bids on it, it came in too high. So we recognized that that kind of expense on those on the bathhouse and the work that needed to be done was was over our budget and that we had to pull back and re relook at everything that we were doing. So we did not have, I mean, the council, if it chooses, could have a conversation about the um, future of two pools in the town, but that's not the conversation we're having. We're looking at trying to replace the bathhouse so that pool could still be actively used. But the pool doesn't need repair then? No. No. Okay. Kathy? Paul, I, I have questions that aren't whether you can easily answer, but um, the news about the Jones Library on the historic tax credit has been definitively turned down for them. Um, to the extent other major grants end up being at risk, will, will the town be on the hook for the whole $46 million minus the endowment, or do we, does that come back to us for a decision is if, I don't know quite how much I want to word that, you know, and that the other two, just so people, the other two that have a historic review are NEH and HUD. Um, so we don't, we don't know what the outcome of that will be right now. So it's a question of, does it ever come back for us to take a look at it mm -hmm. or not? It would come back if the if additional money is needed from the town in terms of um, an allocation from the town. 
Uh, but only, I think before, only if it's higher, not if, if we're at risk for much more money than we right. thought. But before we sign any contracts, we have to make sure our financing plan is, so, is solid and you know that there is a privately, there's a private component to that. And I think that's something we would be looking at very carefully uh, before moving forward on it. But so Kathy, I think what you're trying to clarify is even though we voted the amount for total borrowing, if we are going to increase what the town is going to contribute to that, that has to come back to the council. And that's what I've asked him, Lynn, mainly because, you know, grants that in good faith they thought they were going to get, um, if those tends out to be at risk. And we 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 know the 1.5 wasn't in the equation when we were looking at it. It was just a potential last November. Um, but this news used uh, the turn down of federal tax credits used the National uh, Department of Interior Standards for Historic Preservation and Renovation and NEH and HUD both use those also. So I don't know what, where that will come out. Mm -hmm. So that is my question, Lynn, because yeah. it, it starts to be more than the total endowment. So even though the library has pledged the endowment, so that was, in fact, the, the guts of my question. Then I have one completely unrelated. I know because I took the tour of the wastewater treatment plant, which was astounding, I just what the staff is doing there. But I had a brief conversation with DPW on a traffic, an intersection at the Fort River School, and they said, we we did have a traffic study. There were going to be some options. And I just know when when are we going to see those? Because I think we'll be needing to apply for a grant. So it's a question of timing. Because um, uh, I don't know what the content is of what they came up with, with as possibilities. Mm -hmm. So I mean, with the um, town engineer and the DPW superintendent, I think either this week or next week, and we'll go through the timing of all those things. And I'll let you know what those are. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know whether that has to come back to us the way some of the others, you know, if there's a roundabout or a widening of oh. a road or a... Yes, so it would come back to the council. There is, as as anyone imagines, there's a sense of urgency. If we could get it done before the school opens, it would be nice. Or if the school opens, but we know what's coming, that would be great either way. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Paul, um, actually Jennifer and I, we no, it was Pam Rooney and I were together for our tour of the wastewater plant. And I would like that at some time in the future, um, with the knowledge that other municipalities have approached us to link into our wastewater treatment, that we you know, at least have a discussion about how that might happen and what the cost, if you will, of joining in to an already existing facility means for somebody coming in after the fact, especially since what we saw was a facility that needs to have a long range plan for repair. Okay. okay. Are there any other questions of the town manager? Okay, then, um, Town count. I've I've submitted a written report. Are there any questions? Yes, Councillor Haneke. Um, I have two main questions, and there's a potential for a bunch of sub questions on our under them. So I'll ask um, the first one, and then I'll go on to the second one after. Hopefully, you can answer the first one. You mentioned um, having meetings with both the finance committee chair and a member of the finance committee with. Pelham, Schutzberry, and Leverett Select Board and Finance Chairs, but you didn't actually talk about a summer or summarize what the content of those meetings were. So I am asking for a summary of the content of all three meetings. So basically the uh, reach out, the pur purpose of reaching out was because we did send them the letter that um, the council approved, okay? And in the process of sending that letter, offered to have a meeting with them to talk about, you know, kind of our message, if you will. And to get a sense, although because we weren't meeting with full committees, that nobody can make a commitment or a statement. What is very clear based on the last meeting that uh, we had just today, and that is that there is a strong desire to have a four towns meeting 
as early as sometime in August and start proceeding with a discussion that brings in the financial uh, perspective of each of the four towns. So we use the basis of our letter as a way to reach out. And I have to say, the other towns were really appreciative of that. They felt like it was an important uh, thing that we reach out and there was a lot of clarification needed. And Andy or Bob, you may have additional things you'd like to add. So, and, but Mandy Joe, you said you had an additional question. I did. Um, your report also indicated that on July 5th, you met with Dr. Herman. This was different from the Cup of Joe meeting. And so I have a lot of questions about that meeting. Um, who was invited to it? Why were you there? Um, who else was there? Um, what did you discuss? Um, and here's the big one. Do other counselors ever get a chance to meet privately with the superintendent in the same manner that you did? I was invited. Never, I mean, I don't know who else was invited. And in fact, what I do know is that Paul's met with her a couple of times. I'm sure if the council would like to have individual meetings, she will do them as she can. Uh, what was discussed was just generally how she's approaching this period of time. Uh, she is working with Desi because she has to submit a plan that is required by the schools, by Desi. And she sees the plan as basically necessary and a first step towards getting to a financial uh, sense of her, of like we've been talking about. Um, we talked about her approach to staffing uh, central administration. Uh, she feels, I think, a little understaffed at this point because there's nobody in charge of curriculum and instruction, if you will. Teaching and learning, I think, is the word that she uses. Um, and we talked about um, her office being in the middle school and wondering whether or not, the, she mentioned this a couple of Joe as well, whether or not with the move of the sixth grade to the middle school, whether that space is going to be needed. Um, it wasn't uh, all I was there doing is conveying our financial understanding. Again, she had received our letter as well. Um, Paul, do you, you meet with her regularly. Uh, maybe you have a better sense of her availability. Yeah, I mean, she started on July 1. She, um, you know, um, I was surprised that she had reached out so as quickly as she did. Um, mm -hmm. But I think she had a list of people that she was trying, you know, connecting with. She met with the police chief, the fire chief. Um, the um, president of the council, um, me, uh, and I know there were a number of other people that she's meeting with in the district, and that was probably her priority. Um, so I think she's doing her due diligence and meeting with, with mm -hmm. as many people as can. She did announce at uh, the Cup of Joe that she was doing a, a lot of one-on-ones and that she had the uh, a lot of work, and she, she was going to suspend some of those one-on-one -on -one meetings um, so she could get some of the work cleaned up. Um, in the next couple months. Can I make a request? Sure. The next time you get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a department head or something like that out of the blue, it would be very nice if counselors were aware of it beforehand, just like you do with Joe and Mindy, so okay. that we can okay. send questions in or comments in. I was very surprised to see that you got one and you hadn't notified us beforehand to see what we might yeah. want you to discuss with her. Yes. And I th if there are other things that we would like to discuss with her, I, we could either do that by inviting her to a meeting and or uh, sending them along. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Future agenda items, just very quickly. Next meeting, if nuisance bylaw gets through GOL, uh, it still has another legal review. It would come to the council. The waste hauler will come to the council, uh, finance committee appointments, uh, town manager appointments, and the vote on the planning board. Those are the items I have. Pam, Pam Rooney. Uh, a belated question for the town manager relative to the nuisance bylaw. Do you know what the schedule is for KP Law's review of that? I don't. I can find out for you, though. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we are going to move. Are there any other council comments? Future agenda items. Mm 
Okay. Then I just need to get my motion sheet so I make the motion properly. Um, we are going to move into executive session. Just nobody move yet, okay? You will receive a different link for the executive session and we will not return to a general session afterwards, okay? So I'm going to make the motion that moves us and that is to convene in executive session in accordance with Mass General Law, chapter 30A, paragraph 21 in parens A7 to comply with or act under the authority of any general or specific law or federal grant in aid requirements to approve and release the following executive session minutes December 18th, 2023, correct? Only one set. That's right. December 11 was previously approved and released. Okay. And in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Paragraph 21A6, to consider the pur purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property, the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental impact effect on the negotiating position of the public body. The Council will not return to open session following this executive session. Is there a second? Second. Okay. And I think we are somewhere around Andy. No, I think we're Jennifer Taub. This is a vote to move into. We're voting to move into executive session. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelos. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Aye. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. It's unanimous. We will actually go off of this link, so we will no longer be visible to the public. And we will, you've been sent a link in your email, and that's the link that you should immediately go to. Thank you. Bye.